Let's not have another chicken or the egg debate meal. No, let's. Chicken. Egg. Chicken. Egg. Chicken. Egg. Chicken. Egg. Chicken. Egg. Chicken. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Critically Acclaimed, the podcast where highbrow and lowbrow collide. It's the cat flying away from the explosion. Yeah, we might have some cat interruptions today. <laughs> Luke is full of beans. <laughs> my kid, my kitten Luca is is running around like a maniac and mm. really bothering our older cat Sergio. Incidentally, I saw cat interruption at Bonnaroo. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> this sounds like a really crappy indie band. Uh, who are you? My name is Whitney Seibold. I am a film critic for various corners of the internet. Only the good ones, though. Mm. Not the bad corners of the internet. No. Uh, I don't have a cool nickname. People just call me Hey You. That's right. Uh, my name is William DeBiani. I'm also a film critic for the internet. You can find my writings at The Wrap and IGN and our website, criticallyacclaimed.net. Everybody calls me Bibbs. Uh, this week on Critically Acclaimed, we have a whole bunch of stuff going on. We have Luca <laughs> knock it off. <laughs> Luca is the kitten, and Luca is destroying the apartment. We have we, we have do, a but we do have a lot of cat. We ha- we also have a lot of reviews to give. We're just gonna have to let that go, Luca. I swear to God. Okay, fine. <laughs> do you need to stop the show? No, this is fine. Go- the people need to know what my life is like. <laughs> You this know, week, if, if an adorable kitten is the worst mm. of your problems, you're pretty you're pretty well off, I'd say. This week on Critically Acclaimed, we're going to be reviewing the new releases: The Equalizer Two, Unfriended, Dark Web, Blind Spotting, and Godzilla: The Thingy of the Thingy. <laughs> City on the Edge of Battle is the title of the film. Mm-hmm. Like City on right. the Edge of Forever, but there's battle instead. That's fantastic, yeah. Luca. I swear, please knock that off. <laughs> Just playing with this piece of plastic. Okay, mm. it's fine. We also have a review of Movie 43, the Which notorious was... motion picture chosen by you, our listeners, on the Schmoville Exclamation Point Facebook page. It is one of the most notorious movies of the decade, with an all-star cast of actors doing God knows what. <laughs> they convinced some really, really good actors to do some really crass things. And, like, no one in the cast, like, agreed to do the press tour when all was said and done. They were mm. all just like, oh, you did that? Oh, yeah, no, I didn't know you were doing that. No, we're not gonna. Uh, you know, they, they're part... They knew what they were doing. They didn't know they what the movie pretend. was going to be. They didn't know what the movie was going to be, okay. necessarily. You know, they didn't know how mm. it was all going to work together. Okay. Oh, Luca. You know what? Given what Hugh Jackman did in that movie, there's 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 not a lot of ambiguity. Well, Hugh Jackman has no excuse. <laughs> Same with Halle Berry. You know, there's there's no ambiguity for some of these shorts. Fantastic. <laughs> mm. Well, in any case, we got that going on. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, and, let's and oh, and we also paired it with a notoriously good film uh, uh, yes. as a, sort of a B feature and, uh, and to we... something to to balance. The notoriousness with something uh, notoriously good. Yeah, what's the good version of movie forty three? Mm-hmm. And if you've seen the title of this episode, you know what that is. Uh, but but first, it, but if you haven't, surprise. But first, but first, jazz I'm hands. gonna I'm gonna move the cat. Hang on, you right. tell people about the first movie. Let's talk okay. about the Equalizer. The equalizer two. Okay, um, the Equalizer two uh, is a sequel to the Equalizer. It is the first sequel uh, that Denzel Washington or director Antoine Fuqua have made, um, and it's uh, both films are based on a 1980s television series about an Equalizer. That is a, a freelance vigilante, sort of a Punisher type dude who uh, sort of does well in his community. He's very civic-minded. In the movies, he's especially civic-minded. The Equalizer 2 uh, picks up, not really where the first one left off, but we do meet our our hero on a train uh, in Turkey, where he beats up a bunch of bad guys, and it's established what a badass he is. Then we're introduced to him again, where he's a Lyft driver in Boston, and he goes up into a high rise and beats up a bunch of bad guys, and it's established again that he's a badass. And he beats up those bad guys with their own credit cards. Yeah, he slices a guy open with his own platinum credit card. It's pretty cool seeing a, yu- <laughs> a yuppie get slashed in the neck with his own money. Here's the thing with the Equalizer. The Equalizer is not a complicated concept. He's an ex-black ops guy. Mm. Now he's a vigilante. whoop de doo The original Equalizer movie... Elevated mm. itself, not so much with Antoine Fuqua's direction, which was good and stylish, but not the most amazing direction anyone mm. ever seen. It elevated it because now Denzel Washington is basically playing the Punisher. 
Yeah. And, and Denzel Washington brings something interesting well, to that. What he brings to it is something that's lacking from The Punisher and indeed a lot of superhero movies, uh, which is a sense of righteousness. Um, he plays a character named Robert McCall, and uh, Robert McCall doesn't just want to kick ass. He doesn't just want to stab people in the head. He's not, like, he is sort of tortured. He has sort of a dark past. He doesn't want to be a vigilante, but he is possessed by his sense of wanting to do good and wanting to help people. And in the first Equalizer, he's moved to destroying the Russian mob because he sees a, a young prostitute being abused. Yeah. And he can't can't abide by that injustice. Uh, in the second one, he... There's a big plot point devoted to a young man who lives in his building, uh, played by the actor from Moonlight, who uh, is at risk. He's on the cusp of joining a gang. He might be selling drugs, but he's also an aspiring artist, and Robert McCall wants to keep him on the straight and narrow. So that kind of actual ground-level interaction with the community in a righteous way makes him a lot more interesting and a lot more complex and a lot more heroic than a lot of the superheroes we see in movies. One of the things I think is kind of interesting about the way that they've done these Equalizer movies, the original and the new one, Mm -hmm. is most movies based on a television series or based on a comic book or any sort of serialized content, they tell one story. Mm Mm-hmm. It feels like the Equalizer movies are trying to truncate an entire season. In Equalizer <laughs> 2, he doesn't just, you know, try to uh, stop this, like, small army of assassins who are evil and kill a friend of his, mm-hmm. which is the main plot. He also goes to Turkey and rescues a kidnapped child. He has to find a missing painting for a Holocaust survivor. He has to help a kid right. get back on the straight and narrow. Mm-hmm. It feels like there are all these episodic stories that are getting interrupted by mm-hmm. the main plot. And I actually kind of like that. And I think it's one of the things that contributes to making the Equalizer feel a little different from something like Death Wish. I'm sorry, the cat just made a running leap at something and missed. <sighs> I've got to stop being distracted by kitten stuff. But uh, so that's kind of different. And I think Denzel Washington really sees something really interesting in this character who has a life of extreme order. He's not just, you know, rigid or well-trained. He's he's very clearly obsessive compulsive. uh, And that's something that they play a lot more with in the first one than they do in the sequel. But I think that just sort of contributes to a very distinctive, for lack of a better word, vibe that you get from him that you don't get from the Punisher or Charles Bronson or Jason Statham. Mm. Um, he's a quiet guy who wants to be left alone, who wants to uh, just live an orderly life. And every time something bad happens, he can't stop himself and he has to he, do something about he it. He kind of sighs like, well, OK, now I have to do this. And uh, he, uh, he has a little quirk. He likes to time himself when he's kicking ass. <laughs> he's got a little stopwatch on his wristwatch and he, he hits it and then he like kills eight guys. And is like, well... It's like he's trying to beat his own personal time. Well, that took 38 seconds. I've done better before. Okay, so call the police, turn yourself in, uh, or I'll murder your throat. Okay, bye. Yeah. Oh, and uh, leave me a five-star rating on Lyft. Which was cute. That was cute. A lot, a lot of, a lot of uh, product placement for Lyft in, in Equalizer. I think too. it's interesting that Lyft um, wanted to be associated with this violent vigilante. And make no mistake, this is a violent vigilante it, movie. It, like, it's not wall-to-wall action, but whenever the action is there, mm. it feels extra gross. Like, Antoine Fuqua wants you to feel it. Somebody gets their head slammed into a door jam, and that one's really horrible. Somebody gets harpooned in the face in this movie. Uh, yeah, the the violence is unbelievably bloody and, and violent and brutal. And there's kind of a thrill to that. Sure. And I think it, it lends a little bit more weight to the character in this case. Um, overall, the character is really interesting. Mm. The Equalizer 2 is sloppy. Yeah. You talked about how it feels like a season of TV that's truncated. It also has a villain that is just boring. Oh, yeah. So, like, the main plot is mm. Melissa Leo plays his last good friend from the CIA. Um, and at the beginning of this movie, she is killed, and he has to try to avenge her death and protect well, thing, her, her it's, husband. And It's almost halfway through the movie that happens, though. It takes a, a while to get going. Yeah, it also bothers me, and it's a trend I've seen, I've seen repeatedly this year, where there'll be a sequel, and there'll be a really interesting, really confident, smart, capable female character from the original movie, mm. and then they get turned into a... 
A revenge plot point. A, a revenge plot point, or or just some sort of you know inciting incident for the male hero. Mm. Um, it, it happened mm. in Pacific Rim Uprising, it and it, it bothered me even more then. But it bothers me here now. Melissa Leo is a great actor, and she kind of deserves better. And it happened in Deadpool too. It's a good point, actually. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, mm. it's a frustrating trend. Um, so, but then once we finally like get cracking on that storyline and he gets distracted constantly, mm. <laughs> the twist is super obvious. There's like nothing else it could be. There's mm. no other person who could be responsible. And then they even try to like throw in a couple of their characters that allegedly have a past with Denzel Washington. Like, mm. oh, hey, you remember these guys and they're evil. And Denzel Washington <laughs> is just like, oh yeah, hey guys. That's it. That's the whole, like, I don't know why you bothered, like, even trying mm. to make it a thing. The I, I think there's an intentional move to try to get as many Robert McCall stories in one movie as possible. I think that's just, true. Just in case there wasn't an, an Equalizer Part 3. I think they just think he's interesting in, like, his mm. many adventures and they want to put more in there. And I kind of like that approach to adapting a television series in theory. I think the first movie did it better. I still think the first movie's too long for its own good. The first movie's two hours and 20 minutes. And it, it needs to be... It need a hundred. I, you know? <laughs> it, I think it. I think it just outstays its welcome a little bit. But what it did do was it escalated the action. You know, once mm. Robert McCall get, fights off a couple of guys from the Russian mob, they bring in, in more guys in, in, in a the, Home Depot, which is a great setting for a showdown. Yeah, but they bring in more guys after that, and then more guys, and then a proper villain, mm. and you know, it builds to something. Here, they kind of forget to build to something. So, like right at the end, in the big climax, they're like, "Screw it! Uh, it takes place during a hurricane. A hurricane." Mm. Just to make it big. And it doesn't really work. And it's not, uh, nobody's getting wet in that hurricane. Like, there's no rain, curiously. Well, it's just the, a the, wind hurricane storm. Is, the hurricane hasn't really gotten going yet. I guess not. I also like that at some point, like, between them, like, kidnapping someone Robert McCall cares about mm. and driving to this hurricane town, mm. Robert McCall stopped and made a lot of photocopies. Yeah. He's like, to, oh my to, God, this, tease this, a guy, yeah. this alleyway is like papered with like pictures of Melissa Leo. And I'm just like, when did he do that? <laughs> I don't buy that for a second. Well, that was one of his one of his freelance gigs. He has to make ends meet, you know, yeah. through his various gigs. And he has a, a, a copy service in the back of his lift. So yeah, I think, just has a Xerox machine. Back I think there. the word he used was sloppy. And I think mm -hmm. that's a really good way to put it. It just doesn't feel very cohesive it doesn't feel like everything's put together but all the individual pieces are fine yeah, and except fact, for like the bad guy who's just kind of generic but there's a really great speech that he gives uh his young ward mm -hmm. uh when after he rescues him from essentially a drug den mm. he's like well you, you have a choice you can choose the life you want to live and, and you know he's denzel washington he's a great great actor and he acts the hell out of that scene and it's actually incredibly intense mm -hmm. and deserves to be in maybe a drama with no action in it at all. I like um, about a, about an older fellow who's trying to save a younger fellow from risk. I like the uh, mm -hmm. that when Robert McCall like saves someone or like saves their life or helps try to get them on the straight and narrow, he doesn't just like, "Hey, stay away from gangs. Let me get you away from these gang people." Now you're around the corners. So everything's fine, right? Mm -hmm. He also hands him a book by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Yeah, <laughs> which I was just like, "Wow, classy." No, no know your heritage. Re read some Ta-Nehisi Coates, and he's reading Proust. Yeah, uh, carrying on a plot point from the original, he uh, was reading the 100 greatest books ever written that his uh, his uh, dead wife was reading. Yeah. And he was taking on her legacy and reading the books that she was reading. I, I really thought I really liked the way that they described mm. that. I can see why Denzel Washington has an affinity for this character because he's mm. a thoughtful, smart guy, and he's a, and he's a he's even though he's done horrible things, there's a kindness to him. And he, they mm. talk about like you're reading these 100 books for your dead wife, and it was like, yeah, I want to make sure that when I see her again, we have something to talk about. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of nice. In in the last film, there uh, the literary analog was the old man in the sea, mm. an old man, and that's a little bit more appropriate to the Robert McCall character sort of mm -hmm. giving your all at the end of your life to, to achieve one final thing that might not even be that big of an achievement, but it feels like something. Uh, this one, he's reading the final volume of A La Recherche du Temps Perdu, which nobody ever gets to Yeah, <laughs> of, of In Search of Lost Time. I've never read it. Uh, the bookstore owner hands it to him. He's like, oh, good. You're reading In Search of Lost Time. Which volume? You ordered it for him. You would know. <laughs> also, if he's reading all the volumes, that would be kind of a big deal because not a lot of people read the, the entirety. And 
that's uh, this weird sort of psychological real work of psychological realism where everything's very stream of consciousness and it's half remembered memories and mm-hmm. new memories and trying to uh, tell your life story through everything you barely remember rather than things that actually happened to you in your life. That doesn't seem um, to relate to the Equalizer 2. Not at all. <laughs> and I he mean, does, does and it he does, have to? I mean, like, it if feels you're go- weird, If right? you're going to introduce that, try to write in something that has some kind of parallel, there's right? This, there's this interesting- that was something that played into the narrative of the first and it doesn't do anything for the second one it's this interesting thing where like when you need to introduce like you need to see a movie on a tv screen or you need to have show a character reading a book there's this temptation to have it be something that's really on the nose yeah and sometimes that can be really distracting but when it's completely random it's also really distracting Mm. you want to try to find this happy (laughs) medium like somewhere in the middle there's something that kind of relates but Mm. isn't like just the script like it isn't just like can we just rip this off or or like find a situation where somebody has read it or you can quote it something like you know something about that book Mm-hmm. I, I want to get the sense that the screenwriters know something about the book they're writing about. And I didn't get any of that from, from yeah. although they did, you know, name check Ta-Nehisi Coates appropriately. So Fair they've enough. read that much. Uh, and you, you just know that was Denzel's idea. Probably. <laughs> but um, listen, it, listen, it's OK. Like, it's a watchable it's, whatever. But like it's, it's passable. It's one of those sequels where sometimes they'll put together a sequel and it just seems like, OK, the first one did well. Now we have more money and more time. We can attract bigger cast members and we can really go nuts the second time mm. or there's uh, uh movies where they just try to kind of kind of just do the same thing again kind of retread it maybe like tell a slightly different story this is that mm. it's okay if you like the first equalizer it's okay i kind of like what they tried to do and try to turn robert mccall into a real thinking man's hero uh who can in his way be kind of a paragon for people to kind of look up to mm. i can appreciate that but ultimately the plot just doesn't yeah. meet the standard of the character. It's a great character in search of a great movie. Mm. And I would love to, like, if they want to do a third one, you can. fine. But I want to see maybe what a different writer could do with the material yeah. or, or or maybe even a different director. I like Fuqua as a director, but, like, there's there's more to be done with Robert mm. McCall, I think. I, I've come to tolerate Antoine Fuqua. <laughs> uh, he, well, he, he came out of the gate with stuff like The Replacement Killers and... That one wasn't good. And then he did no. Training Day, which is actually not one I'm very fond of. I, I like it a lot. Uh, we, we, this is one of the movies we really disagree yeah, on. Yeah. Like, uh, I think uh, it's great. Movie. Again, it, it's another case where Denzel created a way better character than the movie he's in. Can, can, you, t- can you tell me anything about Ethan Hawke's character in that movie? Yeah, I love Ethan Hawke's character in that movie. The whole movie's about him. It's also really, really ugly. I hated his photography style for like the first half of his career. It wasn't until he started... You know, getting some lights in his movies <laughs> that actually started to like them. Well, um, his his remake of the Magnificent Seven was I liked it. Okay, I it's guess. a fun movie, C- kind of forgettable. Yeah. It's fun. Um, this is the fourth time he's worked with Denzel. I think they should just stay together. They're good together. <laughs> yeah, they have a good groove. Mm. Um, all right, let's move on. Tell me about. Mm. I guess we're going to split this up. Tell me about Blind Spotting. Okay, uh, Blind Spotting is. Um, a film about a young man who has just been released from prison and he's going to be on uh, probation uh, for a, a certain amount of time. And he's three days away from the end of his probation. He has to live in a halfway house. He has to make sure he's on the up and up. Otherwise he goes back to prison. And uh, the three nights away from the end of his probation, he witnesses a police shooting. Um, a, a black man runs by his car and he's shot by a white cop and he just has to drive on. That hangs in the air for the rest of the movie. Mm. Uh, this takes place in Oakland, and in fact, it's the the second indie film this month, actually, that is all about racial tension in Oakland. Uh, Sorry to bother you was the other one. Mm-hmm. And uh, he has to uh, work for a moving company with his best friend. Uh, the two actors who play uh, the, the lead character and his best friend are also the screenwriters. And uh, they have to sort of just sort of talk and survive and try to figure out what their town is going through, not only in terms of racial tension, but in terms of gentrification. Mm. They go into their local. uh, There's a lot of funny scenes where they have to sort of butt heads with the local hipsters, guys who have to stop in front of their moving van so they can unload all of their Whole Foods produce. They go into their local liquor store and they're selling kale smoothies for $10 a pop. And they're not really sure exactly what their... Uh, what their place is in this world anymore. Mm. Uh, and as the days progress, we realize that uh, our, our lead character is played by uh, David Diggs, 
who uh, was in Hamilton, mm. uh, is just being he's having these recurring nightmares about sort of being gunned down by white cops. And it's about the tension that uh, young black men live with now. Mm. And it's very salient. It's very up to date. It's very immediate. And it's told very energetically. It's not just a really sort of serious drama. It has a almost a do the right thing vibe to it about how we explore the neighborhood and we see the different facets of the neighborhood and our mood changes really quick, quickly. Uh, one day, uh, in one moment, they're having a really quick conversation. Another moment, they're freestyling. Their speech is so uh, sort of scattershot and so uh, bantery that they just sort of jump right into rap and poetry and slamming right there on the spot. And it's really exciting to watch. Uh, and then uh, something really violent will happen and everyone is going to be really kind of tragically hurt for a long time. Does it feel like there's like a narrative mm. through line? Because you're making mm. it seem just very experiential, except mm. for that main inciting incident. Uh, I mean, it does come to a head and there there is going to be a climax to all of this. And there's going to be a final confrontation between David Diggs and let me look up the other actor's name. Uh, the uh, other Raphael screenwriter. Casal? Raphael Casale. Raphael um, Casale. Raphael Casale. Yeah. Real best friends wrote the screenplay together. And how... The way they behave uh, is kind of getting them both in trouble and not in that in sort of a racial type of way, how one of them is white and one of them is black and how they've never acknowledged that in their friendship. But it's becoming more and more necessary to do so and acknowledge the way that they're behaving uh, to one another and getting each other in trouble. Uh, so yeah, it, it does have a lot of climactic moments. I mean, do the right thing is kind of experiential, but then it does have a gigantic horrific climax Yeah, and then, you know, a, a big release thereafter. It's not quite as big as do the right thing, but it does feel just as immediate and it feels really important given the violence that's happening in real life right now. Mm. Uh, this is a, a young filmmaker who's trying to address this very directly <laughs> And it really is an enjoyable watch. It's really exciting to yeah, watch. And it's really uh, terrific it... to see all of these very modern things dealing with gentrification, dealing with racial tension right now. I'm seeing, like, the, the last couple of mm. weeks, you've mm. run into movies that you loved and I just didn't see. Oh, yeah. Sorry to Bother You, followed mm. by Eighth Grade. Eighth Grade and, and now Blind Spotting. These are all, like, three of the best films of the year. Are, is it really? Because yeah. that was my thing, is I couldn't mm. quite pick up on how passionate you were about Blind Spotting. It sounded mm-hmm. like there was a lot of intellectual appreciation. Are you? Mm. Do you really feel like this is a great film, or um, is it a really good one? I feel like this is one I need to ruminate on a little bit more. I don't think it'll fall in my estimation, though. It's it's really, really sta- sticking in there, and there's a lot of really indelible imagery. There's a lot of horrible nightmares. And watching David Diggs you know, essentially freestyle on camera is really exciting. Yeah. Uh, the racist white cop, by the way, that we see uh, commit the shooting at the beginning of the film is played by Ethan Embry. Ah, oh, that, I buy from, that. From Freaky Links. Uh, yeah, he's been getting like weirdly like mm. tougher. Like, yeah. like in like the guest and things like just in darker material. And, That's and, interesting. and I didn't rec- like I barely recognized him. Like the credits rolls like, oh, yeah, that is Ethan yeah, Embry. Good for him. He, he's not that little teenage schmuck from Empire Records anymore. He's <laughs> he's a man now. Yeah. And he's been working a lot. And yeah, he's d- take out, took on this really provocative role. Wow. Um, well, mm. it sounds like that's a hell of a lot better than Unfriended Dark Web. Um, I didn't see Unfriended Dark Web, so I hesitate to agree. Okay, uh, I'm going to say it. <laughs> there is a 99% chance mm. that Blind Spotting is better than Dark Web, having not even seen Blind Spotting. Mm. Because Unfriended Dark Web mm. is a quite bad movie. I'm just going to come out and say it. I'm going to say it as well, politely as I can, but as directly as I can. I know the first. I didn't see the first Unfriended either, but from what I understand, it got slightly more acclaim than you would have thought for a film called Unfriended. Uh, it was still mostly trashed. Uh, Unfriended came out about four years ago now, um, and it's. A novel premise, the sort of thing like Hitchcock would have come up with if he was doing today. Mm. Can we tell an entire movie, in this case a horror thriller, entirely from the perspective of a laptop screen? Mm. Not pointing outward, but pointing inward. Just looking at people on the internet... Mm looking things up, Skype calling people. And this has like, been a couple, done a couple times since then. Yeah, Unfriended didn't invent this. Mm. There's a Nacho Vigalondo film called Open Windows. Apparently there was at least one other film in like the early 2000s that tried to pull this off. Yeah. Um, so it's not like entirely unique, but it is a very limited way to make a movie. So most people don't bother. <laughs> most people aren't trying, and I, I know, understand. It only fits oh, so many narratives. John Cho is going to be in a thriller. Searching. Coming. Searching. Yeah, yeah from, another one. Uh, also, I think, produced by Timur Bekmembe, uh, who also oh. is behind these unfriended movies? Oh, mm. 
The first unfriended <laughs> is not. Oh, a, oh Timur Bekmambatov. The first unfriended oh. is not. By any stretch of the imagination, a great movie. And, of course, it gets a lot of things about technology wrong, which almost every quote-unquote cyber thriller does. Um, But it does seem to exist for a reason. When you look at, like, a lot of sort of uh, uh, interesting or memorable horror thrillers, they usually try to tap into something kind of relevant, something that uh, uh, can really hit close to home. Mm -hmm. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmares, very primal, very simple. Jaws, I'm animals being yeah. eaten by a shark. You know the the vast void of the ocean. Anything could eat you. It's scary. Uh, Unfriended is a little bit more specific, and but very modern. And it's the idea of internet trolls. And mm-hmm. the first movie was about a young woman who was humiliated by a group of internet trolls who it, in, into suicide, right? In, yeah, into yeah. into killing herself, and she did. And now it's like a year later. And a group of people who knew her are now being haunted on the internet <laughs> by the ghost of this young woman. And the idea is that they were the trolls, or whether directly or implicitly, and now they're getting their comeuppance. And that's the plot. You are yeah. a bad person on the internet. It will come back to haunt you. Is it, is it a ghost or a serial killer? Is she still alive? That's yeah. the mystery. And, and, and they, you find out by the end of the movie, but... Yeah, and honestly, as an idea for a horror thriller goes, it's like, okay, people who are uh, uh, cruel and abusive and harass people online, uh, the idea of turning the tables on them and making them fodder for a horror thriller, not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And certainly an idea that justifies the approach of Unfriended, which is taking place on a computer screen. Unfriended Dark Web doesn't really have a point. It's just sort of a thriller, and and, and it is it's still told from window screens, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, the opening screen is someone trying to guess a password in order to get onto a laptop that they found. All right. And uh, they get onto the laptop. The person's still logged into Facebook, and he's getting suspicious messages. But it, that's probably not important. And the guy sets up his like his Skype and his own social media. And he starts uh, having like a Skype call with his friends, and apparently they're, mm. they're all in different places, so they do game night together online. Okay. Okay. I've heard worse ideas. This is fine. Then it turns out that his it, that this laptop is like almost out of memory. It's giving him a lot of problems. So he does a search. It turns out there's only one folder on it. That folder is hidden. It cannot be deleted, and it is full of snuff films. <laughs> Which is a creepy premise. That's yeah, super yeah. creepy. And it turns out that the person who owned it was making snuff films to sell on the dark web, which is ah. a real thing. It is the uh, un... What, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the un... The, the, unregulated? The, the unregulated part of the internet where mm. the criminality takes place. Mm. And if you know anything about it, if you've done any research, there was a great article in Time about it a couple of years ago. I still uh, still don't know how to... Like, I'm so not tech savvy. I don't I, even know where to go I to get something I like that. I don't want to know. Yeah. I don't want to know. Uh, yeah, I know don't, enough to know. I don't want to know. Don't don't tell me. <laughs> the dark web is a scary concept, and telling a movie that delves into that, mm. making a movie that delves into this real life, really scary place, makes a lot of sense. I imagine it's not at all factual to what like the actual dark. I don't web know is. any more than what I read, and like I said, in an article in right. Time or Newsweek or whatever, but. I do know that if it is like it's shown in Unfriended Dark Web, it's very silly. (laughs) Because the snuff film idea is really a scary idea. I'm totally with you on that. He's stolen this laptop from a guy who is obviously a serial killer. And now the guy wants it back. And he's going to, like, stalk everyone he knows on social media. Like, right. literally, like, go to their houses mm, and kill make, them. Make and snuff films. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's, f- that's fine okay. enough. It's fine. not a great idea, fine but enough, it's fine. Fine enough premise for a film. But all of, like, the little things just don't work. Like, there's this whole thing, like, oh, yeah, uh, cool, click on this, this one weird icon. Maybe that'll tell us more about who this guy is. And then there's, like, the graphics from Doom... But the original Doom from like the mm. 1990s, it looks all blocky and crap. Uh-huh. And it's like, oh, we're on the river. Yeah, this is an important part of the of the dark web because it's like it's a picture of like a canoe on a river. <laughs> and I'm just like, what? And then later on, when they get like pulled into like the real dark web, the graphics on that canoe get way better. Mm. And I'm like, oh no, run! Oh, oh no, I got a SIM card. <laughs> what, what, whatever it is that you, you get to get better graphics. Great. Thanks, Intel Inside. <laughs> like, 
all of the uh, everything involving the movie, everything about the movie's technology, everything about the plot is kind of hilariously contrived. And the more it's, you it's find out about the be- way that the better mo- or worse than Friend Request, the movie Friend Request. More convoluted than Friend Request. Okay. But probably equally dumb. <laughs> Friend Request was another cyber thriller. Mm. This one, that one was about a ghost on the internet. Um, and she downloaded herself onto Facebook. Yeah, not, not into a, like a hard drive, but specifically onto social media. Yeah. Scary. <laughs> uh, and that's another one where, like, again, they kind of, that one, at the very least, they toyed with the idea of sort of the way people are outcasts in a social media world yeah, and mm-hmm. what it means to have no one like you online. And they could have done something that had... Something that wasn't totally stupid. They could have had but, something yeah. kind of uncomfortable, kind of scary, something that mm-hmm. really tapped into an actual anxiety people have. Instead, they made it ludicrous. Here, they don't really tap into anything. The setup is okay. All the implementation is stupid choices made by stupid people. And indeed, once you get to the end of the movie Mm -hmm. and all is revealed you realize nothing made any sense like at (laughs) all like all this it's based on a huge pile of a hundred coincidences needed to take place in order to get make this movie Mm -hmm. the way it is but because it ends in a dark way it feels like oh this is like jigsaw someone like brilliant master plan it's just like no (laughs) this feels like immature cynicism like Mm. ah everything's horrible and we're all gonna die like i i know that feeling it's immature (laughs) yeah it's it's a feeling we all have sometimes and it's not healthy and and it's not you know something to really celebrate Mm. and if you're gonna put it into a horror movie you'd better back it up with something and this movie does not back it up with anything it ends up just being very silly just all collapses in itself. The characters are boring. The scares aren't very scary. This, again, the setup is okay, but it doesn't amount to anything. It's mm. not really about the dark web or the kind of people who would go on the dark web. It's about a bunch of bland people who find a bad thing and then people come to kill them. That's kind of it. And uh, anything they try to play with in the middle mm. ultimately just feels coincidental and b- hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> um, Blumhouse is a company that's very interesting because they'll put out some of the best movies of the year and they'll put out some of the worst. Well, and I'm the, seriously thinking about the, whether Unfriended Dark Web or Truth or Dare is my pick for the worst film of the year so far. Oh, golly. That's just, bad, huh? Just really tr- bad. Truth or Dare was awful. Just a stinker. Uh, I mean, I appreciate that they're trying to do new ideas with horror movies. Like, True. a Truth or Dare game is haunted. Okay, I haven't seen that before. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a very good idea. It doesn't sound like a make a good movie, but I'm glad you tried. Oh, it's not good? Well, okay. At least you tried. <laughs> Fair enough. But, mm. and again, they're short. Mm-hmm. They're cheap. If they work, awesome. If they don't work, it's not mm. a big deal. You make your money back opening weekend. We all move on with our lives. Yeah. I can appreciate that. But at the same time, some of us are going to watch this movie. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you right now, your standards might be a, not, might be a little lower than mine. And you might... <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't mean that negatively. Well, I just if, mean like if you're, what you're looking for in a horror movie, this might give you some of the stuff. It's so, got some violence. It's got yeah, some, fast pace. Fine. But I understand, that's not enough for me. I understand what it means to go to a theater on a Friday night at 9.30 p.m. And you're a little drunk or you're a little high or you're just having a good time with friends. Mm-hmm. And you want to all you want to do is squirm in the dark, scream a little bit, giggle, have a good time being scared, and go home. You don't need great art for that. True, but um, you also don't need film critics to tell you like yeah, what, yeah, what's so in, in the movie, whether or not it has if, artistic value. But you know, as, as film critics, sometimes we can acknowledge that it can be effective at that, mm-hmm. uh, even if it's not a good film. Uh, sometimes they're effective at that, and they're also good films. Something like The Quiet Ones or, or, or uh, Oculus. Those are films that are actually, I think, are quite good. The, fair enough, but um, I feel like when a, with a film like Unfriended Dark mm-hmm. Web, which is so kind of poorly constructed mm. I, I, if I were to tell you it's a good experience to have with a bunch of horror loving friends I, I honestly can't because at that point I'm rating how entertaining it is to watch a bad movie with your friends I well, don't know your yeah, friends yeah. I can't rate your friends I can rate the movie <laughs> uh, if you have cool friends and you watch a lot of bad horror movies together you might have a good time watching this because there's some weird stuff in it there's some laughable moments it's not like mm. 
oh, I hate my life watching this, and God knows I've seen that. But it's a, just a very shoddily made movie, and mm. it really does feel like it's the sort of thing that probably should have gone straight to Netflix or something, where <laughs> standards are significantly lower mm. than they'll be in a theater. Not necessarily. Well, there was The Ritual, and there was Veronica. There's some good films, uh, horror films some. that are going straight onto Netflix this year. That's Well, I didn't like Veronica as much as you did. No, but I, like, I really like Veronica. Uh, fair enough. And like, I'm not even saying that as a bad thing. I'm just saying mm. standards are a little lower. Okay. On Netflix, when you don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> That's true. When you don't have to sit through 20 minutes of trailers just to get to the movie, and then it better be worth it. Mm. You know, like, it's it's a little easier to just sort of gonna, plop down, click gonna, a button, and go, yeah, start, I'm fine. Start the movie. I want some toast. I'll just leave the movie running while I go make some toast. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't mind if it's not great. It just has to entertain me for an hour and a half. Mm. Fine. But I can't judge that. I can judge a movie on its artistic merits. Mm. This is not a good movie. Okay. There you go. Uh, last one we're going to review. Speaking of Netflix, mm. Godzilla and the city on the, on the edge of battle and forever. God, that, that's a Godzilla way to say it. <laughs> Godzilla? <Yes. laughs> no, it's, it's pronounced Godzuki. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> that's a reference for no one. What was the name of Godzilla's son in that one movie? Mini- Milia. Minila. M- Minila. As in Minizilla. Minila. Minila. Yeah. Minila. Or, or, or Minya. Both Minya. Are, that was yeah. it. Minya. That's what I was saying. He was terrible. Yeah. Mi- Minya is awful. Minya's Especially a, in the one where he talks. Like maybe the, the. Is he the worst sidekick in movie history? He's one of them. He's down. He's, he's like in Scrappy Doo territory. Ooh. Yeah. That's bad. Fair enough. Um, Moving on. Netflix has commissioned from Toho, the uh, creators of Godzilla, a trilogy of animated Godzilla feature films, of which Godzilla, City on the Edge of Battle, is the second one. The first one was called Godzilla, Planet of the Monsters. And the premise of the first one was that Godzilla showed up on Earth. They tried a bunch of monster fights to get rid of him. Nothing could destroy Godzilla. They tried all of the oxygen destroyers and all of the big bombs. Nothing could destroy Godzilla. Godzilla destroyed most of the planet. And the rest of humanity said, screw it, we're, we're going to leave Earth, and we're just going to come back when Godzilla's dead. And they leave Earth, and they stay out in the cosmos, living on a gigantic, almost like moon-sized uh, spaceship, for 20,000 years. Jesus! <laughs> Uh, humanity has joined up with, uh, you know, various, like, new cults have arisen on this space station. They've uh, fallen in with another uh, alien race who is also forming, like, a very uh, notable religion. And this religion is the only thing that's staving people off from mass suicides that are taking most of humanity out. They're so depressed living in space that everybody's killing themselves. So they, in, and this is still the first movie. They go back to Earth. They decide, fine, we, we can't stand it anymore. We're going to go back to Earth. Shortly after 20,000 years, Godzilla is dead. Nope. <laughs> uh, there's still a Godzilla, and it's really, really big. And they rally with a bunch of their ships, and there's huge, big action. And they find a weak spot, and Godzilla's back, and they plant a bomb in it, and they blow up Godzilla. He's like, great, we finally destroyed Godzilla. And then a mountain stands up, <laughs> and that's the real Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> it's the return of the living dead ending. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. Well, well, yeah. It turns, we just can't win. It's like they, they destroyed a Godzilla. It's the biggest one we've ever seen. And then there's another one that's like 100 times its size. Like it would be so big it would affect Earth's gravity. It can shoot lasers into space. Like it's ridiculous, <laughs> like crafty in size Godzilla. It's like, well, we're effed. What do we do? End of the first movie. <laughs> well, it sounds like you liked it. Uh, it, it's a fun premise. It's a uh, it's a little too moody for my taste, but it's got good action. It's well animated. It's uh, in that two and a half D animation where it's CGI, but it's made to look like uh, like hand drawn animation for most of it, which yeah. is a style style I actually really like. Yeah, I'm fine with it. Um, sitting on the edge of battle, the survivors of the first Godzilla attack are now stranded on Earth. Uh, turns out there are also other human survivors who are covered with some sort of curious dust. Dust that comes off of an insect's wings. Maybe a giant moth's wings? No, certainly no, not. Sure. No, surely and, and they all have a lot of moth iconography, <sighs> and they run into a pair of identical twins that can no. communicate psychically. It's a hell of a coincidence, I'll grant you, but this couldn't possibly... Guess what? Couldn't possibly uh, be Rodan. Mothra's not in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I was they, joking. They set up a Mothra village... <laughs> And they have psychic Mothra twins. They're like, oh, great, we're going to have Mothra v. Godzilla, but it's going to be super Mothra. Like, Mothra's going to be as big as Godzilla. Nope, Mothra's not in the movie. <laughs> and in fact, most of the movie is the human people, the, the human survivors on the Earth's surface trying to figure out how to destroy a mountain, essentially, using just, like, 40 people and a couple of ships. And as it turns out, 
back in the old days, 20,000 years ago, they did build a Mechagodzilla and it was destroyed. Mm -hmm. They built Mechagodzilla out of nanometal. Oh, good. Nanometal is like a living metal that has been evolving on Earth for 20,000 years and essentially has built a city out of itself because it has artificial intelligence. Go on. They decide to make some battle robots out of the nanometal, but they don't want to put it in their own bodies, which it can do and enhance their own bodies. But there are some humans who want that. So the big conflict is, do we just sort of blow up Godzilla using our cleverness and this nanometal, or do we infect our own bodies, become part of the machine, essentially losing our physical beings and destroying humanity that way? Interesting Star Trekky kind of idea there. I like a good documentary. Not, not really uh, explored in any sort of fascinating way. It's more in an action movie sort of way. Yeah. All the action is right at the end. And Godzilla has another trick up his sleeve. <laughs> and since it's the second part of a trilogy, of course they don't destroy Godzilla. And it ends really depressing. And then... Yeah, and, and again, these, these movies are a little too maudlin for my taste. I, origi- I understand that the 1954 original Gojira was a very maudlin film. It was all about sort of the, the sadness of this destruction and how horrible the destruction was and how bad they all felt that they needed to kill this animal that, that, was, that was destroying them using a, a bomb that was even bigger than the bomb that Japan had just experienced. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of tragedy overhanging all of this. By the time you get to even the third movie in the Godzilla series, and there's gigantic octopuses, and there's drunken Godzilla, or dr- dr- it pretty quick. drunken King Kong flossing with electrical wires to get more powerful, it becomes really silly and a lot more fun really fast. And there's space aliens and Ghidorahs and all that. Godzilla is one of those franchises that uh, mm. it started off great, but like it didn't find its identity until later. Mm. And like James Bond or Fast and the Furious, its identity is quite stupid yeah, yeah, yeah. like not, not but, in a bad way i'm not even that's not oh, an insult. No, they're in, just silly movies in the best possible way i yeah. love all of the godzilla films with the exception of the ones with minya <laughs> <laughs> from the 60s and 70s are are all pretty unilaterally great even the one with jet jaguar and megalon that really aggressively horrible movie <laughs> is still a blast to watch uh and you know by the time mecha godzilla gets involved in the 1970s like yeah 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 Godzilla tw- twist his head off. Like I, w- I was watching those movies a couple summers ago and cheering like I was watching a boxing match. It was you watched great. all of them. I watched all of them over the course of a single summer. That and was it, a good summer. And it marked me. <laughs> <laughs> I am a Godzilla fan through and through from beginning to end. But now. back on point, um, you say it's a bit maudlin. Is it's, it good? Is it fun? Is it feel like I'm just like this weird middle chapter? I'm just waiting to get to the third one. Uh, I, there's not enough monster. Hmm. Now, I understand when you have a Godzilla that big, I mean, there's nothing you can really do with a monster that size. Hmm. They made the threat so overwhelming that you can't have just sort of fun monster on monster fights. They raise the stakes too high. This mon- this Godzilla monster can literally just look up in the sky and just dist- like obliterate humanity with a single fire blast. Just if it knew where to look. It's a good thing Godzilla doesn't know that there's a big satellite up there, otherwise it could just obliterate humanity. Yeah. And, the, and you know, at one point, Godzilla does, like, whip its head back, firing its heat beam, and it nearly obliterates humanity, just in that little simple uh, gesture. Just had a cough. That was it. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> And I, you know, I've seen all, all of the Godzilla films and they do up the stakes to ridiculous levels in some of these things. Like here's Destoroya and it's made of the oxygen destroyer and Godzilla's melting down from his own internal, internal nuclear fire and all life on Earth is at risk. OK, fine. We know how these things end, though. Yeah. This one, Godzilla is too big, quite frankly. <laughs> This is the biggest Godzilla yet, and it's so it's difficult to write a story around essentially Cthulhu living on Earth. Um, they try their best, but it becomes more about the humans and the interpersonal conflicts, which is not what I go to a Godzilla film to say. Yeah, those characters are ancillary. I want to see you know th- thirty minutes of setup, Godzilla destroying for thirty minutes, monster fight for thirty minutes. Finn. That's what I want to see. <laughs> That's the reliable pattern, and it just doesn't doesn't quite work in this one. So it's not as good. It's not as good as the last one. I'm sure when the when we get to the third one, it'll finally conclude. It might feel a little bit more they significant. They got Mothra by that point. I mean, come on, you set up Mothra. They set up Mothra, and they set up another monster in a post credit stinger. Okay, so they got so it. St- stick around through the credits. All right, fine. Well, on the critically acclaimed scale mm. of C minus to C plus, mm. C minus the lowest grade we give, C plus the highest grade we give, C it's okay. Yeah. 
what do you give Godzilla and the thingy mishmackadoo? <laughs> it's a city on the edge of battle. Uh, you, I can just randomly put yeah, words in a sentence, too. <laughs> yeah, and uh, with a name like City on the Edge of Battle, it sounds like a Japanese translation to me. Mm-hmm. Like a literal like, translation. Like a literal, literal yeah. transliteration. Um, it, it's a really high C-. minus. Like it, it doesn't quite work out, but I appreciate all of the effort. Okay. And I'm glad that, God's, that Toho is doing Godzilla uh, a well, America is doing whatever the hell they're going to do with Godzilla. All right. Well, uh, unfriended dark web. Uh, Got to give it a C minus. <laughs> it's just, it's doesn't, just not good. Doesn't sound good. It's just not good. It's not fun enough to really justify itself. Um, it's not the least watchable movie I've ever seen. But I also just flat out don't recommend it. It's mm. not really worth running out to. <laughs> There's better stuff you can find on your actual laptop. Mm. Um, <laughs> tell me about Blind Spotting. C uh, minus C plus. C, definitely a C plus. Yeah, that, that is a great film. You do need to seek it out if it's playing in your area. Uh, yeah, if you have an indie theater that is playing Sorry to Bother You and or uh, Eighth Grade and or Blind Spotting, you need to see all three of these films because they're they're all terrific. All right, and The Equalizer 2. Uh, C. Hmm. I like the character better than I like the movie. Uh, it's a sloppy movie, but I, I love Denzel and I love his character enough to sort of make my way through. So a C. I, I think it's a solid C. Um, if the if the main plot had built organically to something and like had anything to do with anything after a while, like <laughs> we set up, okay, they killed Melissa Leo. That sucks. It's terrible. Oh my God. And then by the end of it, it doesn't feel like it's really connected to the beginning at all. Mm. Feels pretty random. That's a shame. If they had made that together, this could have been a solid C plus great action thriller. But as it stands, mm. sloppy but yeah. watchable. Mm. And yeah, Denzel Washington is fantastic. Mm. So a C right down the middle of the road. <laughs> Equalizer two. Here we go again. All right, which brings us to mm. our main event, our double feature uh, this week. All of our films were uh, films that came out in the calendar year of two thousand and thirteen. Mm, which was a good year for horrible movies. Yeah, you could have picked Lone Ranger. You almost did. Could have picked After Earth. You almost did. It, it was a, it was a pretty close between all three this time. Pretty close, but you picked a film that has gained a reputation for being one of the worst movies, at least of the decade. Some would say ever. Mm. Movie it, forty-three. Mm. Uh, it is Jeff, a uh, comedy anthology starring mo- everybody. Mostly from the Farrelly brothers, but from other directors as well. Yeah, Elizabeth Banks uh, mm. directed a segment. Brett Ratner directed a segment. Griffin Dunn directed a segment. Mm. Uh, it's the cast. I'm going to go down this list. Okay. Okay, we've got Elizabeth Banks, mm. Kristen Bell, <laughs> Holly Berry. This, this is alphabetical, by the this way. This is alphabetical. Yeah. Holly Berry, Leslie Bibb, Kate Bosworth, Gerard Butler, Josh mm. Dumal, Anna Ferris, Richard Gere, Terrence Howard, <laughs> Hugh Jackman, Johnny Knoxville, Justin Long, <laughs> Seth MacFarlane, Stephen Merchant, Christopher Mintz Blast, Chloe Grace Moretz, Chris Pratt, Liv Schreiber, John William Scott, Emma Stone, Jason Sudeikis, <laughs> Uma Thurman, Naomi Watts, and Kate Winslet. <laughs> to name a few. It's not even all of them. It's an insanely highbrow cast. I didn't even say Greg Kinney. And, oh, yeah. or, or, and Dennis Quaid, who are the only real main characters, I guess. Well, well we need to talk about the framing device mm-hmm. uh, in a minute. But the way that this film came together and the way that they got this kind of stunningly overpowering cast mm-hmm. was it's a comedy anthology. None of those people appear in more than like five minutes of the film, except for the people involved in the framing device. Right. Um, so for the most part, it's just a matter of, hey, can we get Hugh Jackman and Kate Winslet? For two days. Mm-hmm. Do they? Do we have anything? And we're just going to film a scene that is them in a restaurant, and it's going to be funny. That's it. And if you don't mind working that way, and if you can make a film over a long enough time, and indeed Movie 43 had a very long production mm-hmm. schedule because they were just waiting for people's availability, yeah. um, you can get all kinds of people. Uwe Boll had a, a, mm-hmm. a bit about this. He had an argument about this because... At the start of his like major Hollywood career, when he was making crap fests like Alone in the Dark and the original <laughs> Blood Rain, he was getting pretty good casts. Like Ben Kingsley is the main bad guy in Blood Rain. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Jason Statham and Ray Liotta and all of these good actors are in yeah, the name yeah. of the King of Dungeon Seeds tale. And it's terrible. And his argument was, if you don't mind who you cast... You can cast a lot of big names. You just got to see who's available that week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is uh, true. And a lot of hardworking actors will just be like, yeah, I'm not doing anything next week. What do you got? 
Oh, it's I'm like, a vampire bad guy. Neat. <laughs> but we'll, we'll give you 50 bucks. Uh, yeah, I'll give you 50 bucks. I'm free today. So they made a whole bunch of mm-hmm. really broad, mostly exceptionally crass comedy like, sketches. Like d- that, I think that was the rise on Dutch of the sure. movie, was they were trying to be as deliberately crass as possible. Sure. Mm-hmm. And indeed, that's, that's which, something which the Farrelly is, brothers is, have been good at before. And it's and it's an admirable ambition. It I'll say that. Some, there's some it can, very it funny, can be an admirable ambition. There's some very funny, very crass movies mm-hmm. out there. Um, and here they just did a whole bunch of sketches and the fundamental premise is each sketch is the worst idea for a movie possible, Mm -hmm. which is funny in principle. There are two versions of the movie's framing device. There's the one that was released in America and the one that was released in several countries in Europe. Oh, I didn't see the, the European version. I didn't either, I've but only I know seen about the, I've seen the American version. I've seen it twice. Because Ameri- I saw it in theaters and, and I rewatched it for this. The American framing device is Dennis Quaid, the great Dennis Quaid from mm. Inner Space and The Rookie, and mm. he's fantastic. Uh, many, many, many great movies. I'm, I'm a big fan. Mm. Uh, he plays a completely batshit insane movie producer and he is pitching mm. a studio head or one of the studio heads played by Greg Kinnear uh, his ideas for movies and the movies are disturbing or terrible and Greg Kinnear eventually just tries to throw him out of his office and then Dennis Quaid pulls out a gun and says you will listen to my ideas mm. and they keep running around the, the the studio while he's pitching him more ideas and trying to get these movies financed so, so the, the, that story is interrupted by all of these shorts as he pitches his yeah. ideas so the idea is that these are all terrible ideas from one guy Uh the other framing device which i believe is available on a blu-ray i didn't see that version i had to watch it uh uh, Mm. on a streaming service which didn't offer this uh it is about a bunch of teenagers who are trying to find a mysterious film called movie 43 which is supposed to be like the worst most banned film in the world Mm. and if you watch it it will destroy the planet and a lot of the movie (laughs) is them trying to figure out what could possibly be in this movie and that's a lot of the different sketch ideas okay and then they do watch it and guess what there are earthquakes and that's the idea both of those are those are both fun ideas those are both okay ideas and indeed a lot of the premises for a lot of these sketches Mm. aren't bad premises but I gotta tell you, I'd never seen this before. This came out to almost universal critical dismissal or vitriol. Mm. There are only two critics I know who like this movie. <laughs> One of whom is the venerable, awesome, generally I, I either agree or totally get behind his opinion, mm. Alonzo Duralde from The Rap and from Linoleum Knife, who we invited to be on this podcast to share his views. Uh, and he, we just couldn't make the timing work. He's a busy guy. The other Mm. is Whitney (laughs) Seibold. I'm sure there are others, but those are the only two I know personally. (laughs) So we're going to talk about this because I I finally saw this movie and I got to be honest, I also hate this movie. (laughs) There's a couple of funny moments, but man, this did not do it for me at Uh, all. uh, I I don't want to give the impression that I'm like trying to defend like an underrated classic here. This is not like an underrated piece of genius. I'm not going to be one of those people who is going to step out and say that something like Freddy Got Fingered is actually some really wry, incredibly intelligent work of satire. First of all, I think Freddy Got Fingered is loathsome. I've actually never seen that one either. I cannot watch Freddy Got Fingered. And I've heard the arguments, and I'm almost convinced sometimes, but I don't ever, ever want to go back to watch it to find out because I think that movie's terrible. Like, that, that's not just, that's crass for the sake of it. That's offensive like pointedly offensive. Mm-hmm. And while you can argue that there's some integrity to trying to deliberately confront an audience with as much terribleness as you possibly can, you're also confronting an audience with terribleness. Yeah. And that's not something I can sit through. Freddie got fingered is awful. Well, and that's something that um, I think we run into, uh, mm-hmm. even with movie 43, where if the entire premise mm-hmm. is, these are the worst ideas for a movie ever. Yeah. The the downside is you're looking at a bunch of really bad ideas, and unless you're really exactly on the right wavelength, there's a really good chance you might just agree with the film. <laughs> yeah, that's all. That's a bad idea. Yeah, uh, I don't think there's some sort of weird arch artistry to movie forty three going on. There's not like a secret surrealist brilliance hiding in movie forty three. That's not my defense of movie forty three. My defense of movie forty three is it makes me laugh. 
And that's kind of it. It's kind of hard to argue with that. Yeah, sometimes, um, sometimes people just have different senses of humor. There, there is a, a type of really aggressively offensive, not maybe not offensive, just tasteless humor that's fallen out of favor. Mm-hmm. There was a, a whole wave of gross-out comedies back in the 90s that, that the Fairly Brothers ushered in. Mm-hmm. With, with, Dumb and with Dumber stuff like and... Dumb and Dumber and There's Something About Mary and all of those imitators. There was a lot of pee and bodily fluids in these movies. Frankly, most of them, because the thing that the Fairly mm-hmm. Brothers did really well, at least early on, was they had all of that crass, gross, offensive humor, whatever you want to call it, and they tried to tell stories with some real genuine sensitivity to the characters and their emotions. Mm. But they just sort of upped the ante on the comic scenarios. Yeah, and some of those movies have aged way worse than others. Mm. But they were effective at the time, and they were very popular, and there was, a, a, again, a wave of imitators. Mm. And the imitators mostly didn't understand that we were supposed to like the people engaged in these mm. situations. And as a result, most of them were just gross. Yeah. That yeah. might still make you laugh, but it's hard mm. to argue that it isn't just gross. Well, I'm not a, I'm not the biggest fan of the Fairly Brothers. I actually like uh, some of their more recent stuff better than the early stuff they became popular for. Mm-hmm. But uh, I still think Kingpin I, is really funny. I haven't seen Kingpin. Kingpin I've, I've seen about really a funny. third of Kingpin. I never actually got around to the rest of it. But... Uh, the, there seems to be a, a type of really, almost, I don't want to say meta humor, but just sort of self-aware, slapstick, spoofy, satire humor that really fell out of fashion. Mm. And not a lot of filmmakers can do it well anymore. And, uh, you know, take a look at the, the Friedberg Seltzer canon, for instance. The only people mm. who are bringing it back are Lord and Miller, and thank goodness. Uh, but there was also this air of really aggressively crass comedy that we seem to have lost that, you know, when movies started becoming more and more PG 13, a lot more four quadrant friendly, we lost the art of the gross joke Mm. of the tasteless humor. And I think movie 43 has good tasteless humor. I think it's okay for a joke to be tasteless so long as it is funny. And I think movie 43 for the most part has more hits than misses tells a lot of legitimately funny, just unbelievably tasteless jokes. Maybe. That, that's, and again, that's my defense. And your mileage will vary on yeah. what is tasteless and what is sort of unforgivable. Mm. Um, the opening sketch, I think, is is a pretty good uh, indication there. It's directed by Peter Farrelly. Mm. It's called The the Catch. Yeah, it stars Kate Winslet. Uh, she's gone on a blind date with an extremely eligible bachelor played by... Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman is handsome, he's successful, he's rich. Mm. He's, Everyone loves he, him. He's polite and wonderful. He's the best catch. He's he's fantastic. And then he they're in a restaurant and he takes off his scarf and he has testicles hanging from his neck like mm. where his Adam's apple should be. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the joke. Well, the, the joke is that no one notices but Kate Winslet. Mm-hmm. Like every, everyone just sort of doesn't really seem to mind Mm -hmm. or like he'll spill soup on it and she doesn't want to say you know you have testicles on your neck she doesn't want to say anything about it and she's being tortured by the fact that she's the only person who can see these things it's 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 a classical sketch premise the Mm. one person who isn't in on it yeah the one person who sees the reality of a situation Mm. um it's the emperor has no clothes the emperor has no clothes is like the earliest possible example of it that i can think of Mm. um no, the Emperor's new clothes, but yeah. Hugh Jackman is having fun in this bit, and mm. he all he has to do is be charming and oblivious he, to, to why he well, might be slightly off putting. Well, and, and, he's, and he's actually he's actually funny. He probably in it, had to go through several hours of makeup to like attach that thing to his neck. So yeah, he's he's totally in on this joke, and he's playing it perfectly well. And Kate Winslet's hilarious. You know, he doesn't being get to play re- this kind of comedy re- very often. Yeah, really kind of good. uncomfortable comedy. Um, it's kind of gross for its own purposes, but mm. it's also the kind of comedy, and this is one of the problems with movie 43, and it's one of the problems with a lot of genuinely bad movies, and I'm going to call 40, movie 43 a genuinely bad movie. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, sometimes describing them makes them sound good. Okay. Or it makes them sound like, oh, that sounds funny. And a lot mm. of the pitches, like on paper, they sound kind of funny, but then mm. you watch them and they're not. And the great example of this is the second sketch, mm. Homeschooled. Oh, with Leah Schreiber and Naomi Watts. Yeah, Leah Schreiber and Naomi Watts play parents of a teenager, and they are homeschooling that teenager. And the framing device is they are explaining to their new neighbors um, how homeschool, like a lot of people don't understand it. We appreciate that in addition to a good education, socialization is really, really important. And we're trying to approximate the entire 
high school experience, which to them what? is mostly bullying. It's like bullying and, and humiliation. Yeah. Yeah. So like they're walking down like the, the, the stairs and they see their teenager and they knock his books to the floor and just says, get a life nerd. Yeah. <laughs> and they like, you know, they're like walking in on him in the shower and making fun of his body. Mm-hmm. And they try to have like, he's, he's going to have an awkward first kiss, but like it's with but his, it's mom. his mom. Yeah. <laughs> like, and it's a thing that sounds kind of funny on paper, but when you watch it, mm-hmm. It's just abuse. Yeah. It's just horrific, horrific abuse. And indeed, the sketch the culminates in the revelation that it is indeed taking a horrifying toll mm-hmm. on this young mind, and it's not funny at all. It's just a nightmare. And it was at this point that I realized, and frankly, most of the movie kind of bears it out, mm-hmm. a lot, and I mean a lot, of the comedy sketches in movie 43 would make great Tales from the Crypt episodes. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, a lot of them are constructed in a very mm. creepy, almost nightmarish fashion because they are not... They're, they're trying to be so offensive, they're trying to shock you, mm-hmm. that the shock can easily translate to and then disgust someone, and then or someone fear. Get, and then someone gets murdered. Yeah. 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 So, uh, um... Yeah, but, so but th- there's there's definitely a, a cruel sense of humor to tales from the crypt. Yeah, absolutely. So that's you're what sa- my point. So you're saying it's not going far enough. Uh, maybe not. Like yeah. maybe it would be better if it was just a horror story. Uh, the next uh, one mm. stars uh, uh, Christopher Pratt mm. and Anna Faris. Uh, they're in love, and he thinks that he wants to ask her to marry him, and there, she has something she wants to ask him too, and he mm. says, "No, you go first. Always a bad idea." And she says that what I want you to do is poop on me. Mm. I want you to poop on me. And it's Anna yeah. Ferris, so she she says it very frankly, she straightforward. Very and she's look, Anna Ferris is a genius. She's well, a comic genius. Yeah, she's really and, great. And she sells every sweet moment of this while saying the word poop repeatedly. Yeah. And and, the, and Chris Pratt, and Chris Pratt is really uncomfortable with this, but he's game. There's a story here about how you know you try to acclimate to your significant other's kinks, mm. um, and there's something kind of genuine about that, and it's kind of sweet that he's actually willing to try it out. And of course, it ends in horror again. <laughs> it ends in a Tales from the well, Crypt ending. It has that Hitchcockian sense of tension. It does not. <laughs> It's a sense just, of tension. It's a ghoulish, easy comics. Instead of a ironic nightmare. Off. <laughs> yeah, here's the thing: I love ghoulish, easy comics. Ironic nightmares. I know, but that's, that's not a, what they're going for. This not doesn't feel malevolent enough. It feels like they're no. trying to be cute, and they're not aware of just how just it's, sick this, it this is. This movie doesn't feel malevolent to you. No, it doesn't. All it doesn't right. feel malevolent enough. It feels like they're trying too hard to be liked. Okay. For it to, for it to play off. And mm. some sketches don't like even mm. just seem to fit in. The next sketch is called Veronica. And, and it's, it's just a conversation. It's a funny conversation. It's actually one of the sketches I thought was funny. It's mm. Emma Stone and Kieran Culkin. Uh, they're young. They apparently just had a really bad breakup. Kieran Culkin is working at like a Kmart or something. And he's giving the, you know, the voiceover like, there's a sale. He's on the, yeah, the, the, the P- he's on the PA. And this whole conversation is essentially on the PA. In and the Emma store. Stone comes in and they have this really fast, really hateful, really, really ba- passionate yeah. back and forth with just some of the most absurd lines of dialogue mm. ever written. <laughs> like it's just it, and, and what's great is how's your face how's your HPV it's your HPV I'm just carrying it for you yeah what's great is mm. Kieran Culkin and Emma Stone are really selling it they're both completely on yeah Emma Stone this is, is directed by Griffin Dunn too yeah, is, yeah which explains a lot like he's really he knows his comedy and Emma Stone is she's a I'm sorry I consider her one of the better comedians of her generation she just really knows how to sell Mm. So it doesn't amount to much And so this one just kind of feels like It doesn't really fit in anything And then we get to another one Which feels like a perversions of science episode <laughs> The I babe <laughs> That, that- it, that really is like legit perversions of science. Perversions of science for those who don't know or those who don't listen to our other podcast, Cancel Too Soon. Mm. A lot of people know Tales from the Crypt. It was an HBO horror anthology series with all star casts, and each episode was a tale of the ghoulish and the supernatural with a twisted sense of humor. They tried to do a spin off series called Perversions of Science, which would have been Tales from the Crypt, but with sci fi. Yeah. It lasted for one season. Some episodes are great, like legit great. Some are not. Uh, <laughs> well, but at least one sucks. At least one sucks out loud. This 
However, this premise is totally straight up perversions of science episode. Mm. So the premise is Richard Gere is the Steve Jobs character and his latest invention is the iBabe, which is a music player which looks exactly like a naked woman. Like a, a, and is played by human actresses. Yeah. The problem is is that uh, the like the port where the the, the fan mm. is in order to keep it from overheating mm. uh, is in a very personal spot and a lot of teenagers are losing their bits. Mm. And the majority of the sketch is Everyone like completely oblivious to why anyone would think mm. to do this, and well, Kate Bosworth as the only voice of reason saying and, because and, it's a terrible idea, and teenage boys are and, and she does point yeah. out we've been protested, we're losing money, everything is horrible. This is a, the worst idea you've ever had, and all of the men in the room say, "Yeah, but we get to have essentially a sex doll." Have you noticed that a lot of the sketches in this are about how horrible men are about their own proclivities and the way they think about women? I'll grant you this. I don't feel mm. a lot of awareness and, 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 of it. And it and I don't well, feel a lot and of the messaging. Me, the men are always punished at the end of their sketches, or they're just made to look like complete assholes. Uh, is the next sketch the one with Chloe Moretz? No, the next sketch is superhero speed dating. Oh, okay, yeah. Super is... Speed Dating is Robin trying mm. to speed date Batman. Uh, Robin is played by Justin Long. Mm. Batman is played by Jason Sudeikis. And, and they can't have... Uh, they can't use the iconography. They can just use the names from the comics. So yeah. they, they wear like sort of dime store versions of, of the superhero yeah. outfits. Uh, Lois Lane played by Uma Thurman is part of the speed dating gag. Mm. Kristen Bell is Supergirl. Kristen Bell would have made a fine Supergirl. Actually, she would have made a fine yeah. Supergirl. Uh, hell, Uma Thurman would have made a great Lois Lane. The cast is game. This really does feel like, and I think it's actually well, Jason's, there was another spit, like another online yeah. like web short they did, kind of like this. Mm. This well, feels I mean, this like is, a like a se- separate thing. Well, it's, it's Saturday Night Live, the, yeah. and they did that. It's on Saturday Night Live with superheroes, just sort of like at a party and and. Uh, uh, you know the the Hulk is, yeah. is uh, has stinky poops. I particularly sort of like Uma Thurman as Lois Lane. I also like it because it's a subversion of her character from my super ex girlfriend. <laughs> the movie I think is a little underrated, um, mm. but uh, it, it's mm. it's fine. Uh, Machine Kids. It's a weird uh, sketch. Uh, well, it's a commercial in the movie, and and that's uh, another premise of what makes this movie so horrible. And we're going to put commercials in it. Yeah. So we have some fake ads in the middle of our movie. Machine Kids is a public a, service announcement yeah. about how when you're yelling at your photocopying machine or when you're yelling at a vending machine for not giving you your right soda, you don't understand that those machines aren't machines. They're just little kids in there <laughs> doing all the work, and you're being very mean to them. Yeah. And it's... It's it's a little little surreal, isn't it? <laughs> it's not really funny. The next episode is mm. uh, Middle School Date, directed by Elizabeth Banks. This one almost works because uh, Chloe Grace Moretz uh, is on a date with uh, uh, a young boy. Mm. Um, she's and over at this house that is populated entirely by a single dad and two boys. And this is when... She gets her period for the very first time, and these guys have no idea how to handle it, and they all freak out. They call nine one one, and she, she's just mortified. Like she yeah. she doesn't like being there. She's really embarrassed, and and it's you know she's leaving blood on the walls, and it's really kind of horrifically bloody. But yeah, these guys don't understand what's going on. I'll just walk home. Don't go anywhere in your condition. And then Dad, played by Patrick Warburton, another comic genius, walks in and is like, "Yep, yeah, look." This is not a big deal. I know how to handle this. Um, actually, I don't know how to handle this. What What do we do here? Something's going on. Your, your bits are falling out. You know, he, he's really confident in how ignorant he is. Yeah. And like, here's and you thing. realize that this is a sketch all about men's ignorance. And that's true. And I actually and it's directed like the, by a woman. So, I like yeah. the construction of this sketch. I didn't think it was particularly funny, but I like the construction of it. Conceptually, it makes sense. Mm. It's followed by a fake commercial for... For when, Tampax. For, yeah. for Tampax about how two women go into the ocean, only one of them gets eaten by by a shark, mm. thank you, Tampax, which is it, not really funny for me because what it does is we just had, hold on, we just yeah. had this sketch that made fun of like men's attitudes towards mm. menstruation and, and women's hygiene products, which, you know, famously in movies and television, men don't understand. Mm. And we just lampooned the ignorance and the stupidity of men in dealing with these things, and that's followed by a sketch 
directed by a guy that, that just does it again yeah. and just and just totally subverts any good that could have come from that sketch. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much of that is just the sort of ramshackle way the movie was produced. They didn't have to put that scene in there, though. Mm. They chose to do that. I put it right they, right thereafter. Yeah, they, they put chose it before, to just yeah. undercut everything Elizabeth Banks was trying to do. This sort of, you know, it's it's broad and it's crass, but at the very least, there's an idea behind that joke that goes beyond ha sharks, <laughs> and it really just it it pissed me off. All right. Honestly, the next sketch, Happy Birthday. Starring Johnny Knoxville and Sean William Scott. Johnny Knoxville has gotten Sean William Scott for his birthday. A leprechaun. A leprechaun. Played Play- by Gerard Butler. <laughs> and the idea is they're going to get the leprechaun to give him their pot of gold. Mm. The leprechaun gets more and more violent mm. and verbally uh, uh, outrageous. And there's a lot of cussing and a lot of violence. It's directed by Brett Ratner. And... Mm-hmm. It, at, at least Brett Ratner is an action director, so the fight feels like a movie fight. Like yeah. I think if a comedy director had tried this, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have read as well. So Perhaps not. I, I'm, I'm not going to compliment you know the the you know uh, virtuosity of the directing, but mm-hmm. this is a, it's capable. Ra- yeah, listen, say what you will about Brett Ratner, please go ahead. <laughs> hmm. Uh, he, he's 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 always been very workmanlike. You know, yeah. he can you'll shoot the movie, the movie will be functionally a movie. Uh, what makes this sketch work a little better than some of the others is Johnny Knoxville and Sean William Scott. Feel they like act, friends. They actually have good chemistry. They actually like their banter. Mm-hmm. Feels like real banter. And so this is another one that feels almost like a real sketch. I still didn't laugh. It's still not the funny. I appreciate on paper why this is funny. It's just not for me. Okay. And it's uh, a lot of it is because all of these sketches are kind of the same sketch over and over again, which is... We're going to watch it for a minute, then they will reveal what the gross-out premise is, or mm-hmm. what the absurd premise is, and then they're going to coast on that, and then it's going to end. Well, it, and that's, that's most of it, and it just gets fine, because all, well, all you need is four or five minutes, and that's all we ever get for any of these I, I disagree things. with that, because it's a movie. You want pacing. You want ups <laughs> and downs. You want to actually modulate. When we get to our double feature, we're going to talk about how they mm. make sketches that are varied, varied in length, varied in joke type. Mm. Um, here, it's just basically, ha, you shocked yet? No? What about now? What about now? Mm. What about now? What about now? What about now? Elizabeth Banks' sketch is okay. What about now? Like, it just tiresome after a while. And by after a while, I mean like two sketches. Uh, the next sketch is called Truth or Dare. Mm. Stars Holly Berry and Stephen Merchant. Once this, again, it's a blind date episode, or at least a, uh, this, an internet date episode. It's sort of the climax of the movie, this this sketch. Um, it's certainly like the it's, big one. Yeah. Uh, they are dating, and they're yeah, on a yeah, date, they're and a, they're trying to spice it up and not just have the usual same conversation. Yeah. Holly Berry has said she's been on numerous blind dates. She's tired of the usual, like, recounting her past. Where's your dad from? What did she do for a living? She doesn't want to talk about that. So they want to play truth or dare. Let's just do something, mm-hmm. and uh, with with Stephen Merchant, and she says, "You know, truth or dare." Go he says, "Okay, dare," and she she dares him to go grab a guy's ass, mm-hmm. and he gets punched. Doesn't fun, go well because because it doesn't go well for him. So he says, "I want you to blow out a blind kid's birthday candles." Yeah, they're just giving like, like a birthday cake to this kid and, right now. You have like thirty seconds. Go, and she does, mm. and from there on it escalates. And boy, does this one feel like tales from the crypt? Yeah, because it ends yeah. up with them, like, it ends up with get, them like, getting like cosmetic ta- surgery and, and graphic stuff, yeah. tattoos on their face, <laughs> and it just this really does have this like really ghoulish sense of humor. Mm. It gets quite racist by the end which kind of bothered me mm. like i don't think i don't think why that i don't see why that was necessary at all to sell the joke because the joke construction is solid mm. it just ends with like just this like really uncomfortable imagery mm. and it's a shame because holly berry and stephen merchant are really game for this oh they're selling it yeah. they're selling this sketch better than you could have ever expected them to and or anyone to i want you to make guacamole with your breast she probably did dip her breast in that guacamole no I, that's a no that it's was a, a, that was a, a prosthetic, prosthetic. Oh, that right. was a prosthetic come on all right <laughs> come <far>. on <laughs> I, I would think Holly no Berry would be game enough to, to dip her breast in guacamole. By this point in the framing device, uh, Greg Kinnear has gone insane. He has grabbed the gun and he's turned it onto his boss, played by Common. And uh, he gets shot mm-hmm. and he like falls over, but then the squibs blow late. 
Oh. And he's just like, well, that's not going to work. And they all like stand up and talk about how they're losing the light and everything like that. And yeah, everyone's just kind of around and we see the film crew and yeah. They, and we, everyone's we, just kind of back sick. off. Everyone's kind of sick of making the movie. And they're oh. like, well, we need to do this. Well, there's only one sketch left, right? Just, well, technically that's true. Greg Kinnear. We'll just play it. <laughs> so they do. Oh. The last sketch is uh, a film. It's from a feel-good, inspirational story about, like, the first black basketball team Mm. uh, to really break into the sport and how they faced all of this racism from all of the white players. And Terrence Howard's, it's mostly his big inspirational speech, which is... We're, this, we're, they're this, white. We're not gonna. They're 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 terrible at the game. This is basketball. They're white. You're black. You're gonna win. <laughs> That's and all. It's like a, so. What you're saying, coach, is we need to do teamwork. No, you're te- you're not teamwork. You're black. You're gonna win. It's a hell of a thing. That's and uh, again. Terrence Howard sells it. Terrence Howard sells uh, the joke. Hmm. And then the credits roll. And then there's one more sketch from James Gunn. From James Gunn. And uh, it's all about how a woman uh, played by Elizabeth Banks is fighting for her boyfriend with a cartoon cat who's in love and, with and its owner. Diesel. Yeah, it's gross and stupid, and I don't care for that sketch. Um, movie 43 is just a whole bunch of stuff that happened. It's, it's gross and stupid. I agree. Sure with, is. I agree with that part. Yeah. It's gross and stupid by design, and I appreciate that. Uh, there, there, can, there is a place for tasteless jokes. Like I said, uh, mm-hmm. in, in def- within reason, in defense of this movie, and uh, you know, there's a, a proud history of tasteless humor in movies, and it needs to be done well. And I feel like it's a skill that movie making has lost. And I feel like movie forty three. Well, again, it's not a classic. Mm-hmm. It's not one I'm going to encourage you to run out and see. It's just one I'm going to defend from its own reputation because I don't think it's deserved. I think uh, it's. It's tastelessness is not what makes it bad. I think it's one of those movies mm. where, again, again, I think it's bad. I, I laughed. I could count the number of times I laughed while watching this movie yeah. on two hands tops. Yeah. And for a mile a minute sketch mm. comedy movie, that's really bad. Okay. I don't think it's well made. I think its reputation, its legendary awfulness, stems from the the curiosity of the film's existence. Mm. You know, you watch like a straight-to-video movie with no one in it, and it's incompetent or inept or not funny, and you say to yourself, well, who cares? Mm. What did I expect? This one, I, I think it's star power is working against it in this Absolutely case. it yeah. is. I think there's so many people who, and let, I'm just going to say, almost all the sketches don't work. For one reason or another, just bad comic timing or overselling mm. the joke or too mean spirited to to really land or not mean spirited enough to be as twisted mm. as they're aiming for. Just poorly modulated from beginning to end, if you ask me. Um, but you're just watching all of these big stars, many of them are quite likable, throwing themselves, just throwing themselves in front of the speeding truck that is movie 43. Mm. And almost all of them get splattered. And it's just sad to watch these great actors just trapped on a ter- mostly terrible sketch comedy show. Mm-hmm. And these are all like kind of embarrassing. And indeed, none of like the main cast did publicity for this movie when it came out. They agreed to be in it, but then they're like, oh, it's all junk? I thought I was the only one. I thought I was special. Turns out you're just humiliating everyone in Hollywood. Well, never mind. For them, they were just making, you know, one gross sketch. And that's all, that was their whole experience. And they worked with one director. You Mm -hmm. know, they they didn't really have a, a hand in the film as a whole. And it's not that it got out of their control or it was can't, turned out into something different. Mm-hmm. It probably turned out exactly as like they expected. Hugh Jackman played a guy with balls on his neck. He knew what kind of movie he was in. Sure. Uh, so it's not like he's not doing publicity because he's embarrassed. It's just because it was just something he did in one afternoon. He doesn't need to go do publicity for that. He didn't agree to. It's a lot of work to do publicity. So why? Why bother? They're, Perhaps. They're, they're all just bit players. So, My yeah, it's, it's not, I don't think like, anybody was really embarrassed to do It does feel like a those. black mark in everyone's permanent record, though. Mm. Like, it's one of those movies when they, like, when they do, like, at the Academy, like, when Emma Stone is 90 years old, mm. 
They look back like, ah, oh, yes, let's let's remember the great career of uh, Lifetime Achievement Award winner Emma Stone. And if they put Movie 43 on there, mm. it means the person who edited that highlight reel had doesn't like of, Emma Stone. Or had a sense of humor. Or had a sense of humor, but even so, mm. like, okay, Emma Stone might be a bad example because her sketch is actually kind of funny. Aww. But like Hugh Jackman, if Hugh Jackman's <laughs> on there, Hugh Jackman's going to be just like, dude, 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 did you have to, dude, dude. But you know what? Dude. He did that. He did. He did it. He, he sat did. in the makeup chair. He knew what he was getting into. Um, they even have a, like a few outtakes over the credits, and he like was improving a few lines and was trying to be as gross as the movie he was in. Yeah, and good for him. Fair enough. Here's my point. This, th- I feel like there's something kind of freeing about being this gross. There it allows a... them to do um, the kinds of material, especially a lot of these performers. Anna Ferris, for instance, would do a "Would you poop on me?" joke. Anywhere, like that's something she would improvise. I think, but uh, I for, for, uh, for fast. But okay. Someone like Kate Winslet doesn't get to do this kind of comedy a lot, and I think for a lot of these people, they found it very liberating mm-hmm. to do something that is not going to take a lot of their time, and where they get to be kind of gross. Here's my thing. So many Hollywood comedies are so safe, and it's not. I'm not saying that this is daring, punk rock, edgy, whatever. It's just. A little off center, and I, I appreciate that. Here, here's here's my point, and the, mm. one of the reasons why I wanted to give a bit of a history of the Fairley Brothers at the beginning of mm. the review, we talked about how the Fairley Brothers made their career not just on crass humor. Other people were doing crass humor. Mm. They did a crass comedy, multiple that had some real heart to them, in which the actors came out of it looking good, you mm-hmm. know? Because, yeah, okay, I I did embarrassing things to my anatomy, but in the end, you know, there was a little bit of heart to it, and mm-hmm. we all had a good laugh, and it didn't really feel particularly hurtful or mean, and, and now we're done, right? And everything's fine, and everyone had a good time. Movie 43 doesn't feel like that, and partly because most of the sketches are based off of Oh my God, how bad would this be? Hmm. And as a result, many of the actors don't come across looking that great. Now, not, yeah. that, not that they come across like they're, they're <laughs> monsters, but for example, the Naomi Watts, Liev Schreiber sketch. They are monsters. They're evil. Uh-huh. They're evil people. And it, there's, there's really no way around that. The sketch nature of the movie does a lot of the cast a disservice unless the sketch is particularly harmless. Hmm. Um so you, you want us to feel sympathy for every single character in every sketch? No, I want the movie to have an overall tone that either embraces the malevolence of the concept mm. and goes full tales from the crypt, or the movie needs to have a better modulated tone in terms of we're all having a good time and we're not just humiliating actors in really gross stuff that exists only to be gross for the most part. Mm. That, I think, is the problem with it. I think it's, okay. tr- it's it's trying to be, like, right in the middle of stuff. And I think if it had gone full evil, could have been great. It, it, would, think, have been, it would have been better if they had, that's And I think sure. if it had been a little bit more benign and a little bit it, more it, playful... It would have been worse. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. But I, I think it probably would have been a little better. And when you say it would have been worse, remember, you're one of two people who like this movie. <laughs> maybe... <laughs> Well, maybe it would have been better my way. I, I don't know. I don't know, but maybe. I admit my sense of humor is a little twisted. It, yeah. uh, or it, it certainly can be. Um, weird, weird things have made me laugh in the past. In movie 43, and that's, yeah, that's really my only, my main defense. Yeah. So it made me laugh. Fair enough. Uh, mm-hmm. The movie we're pairing it with mm-hmm. makes most people laugh. It's one of the funniest movies ever made. Oh. And it also came, mm-hmm. or at least originated, from sketch comedy. And I think it's one of the films that showed how sketch comedy could be incorporated not only into a feature film, but also into a narrative in a way that still feels episodic and segmented, Mm -hmm. but feels a bit more nuanced, a bit more intelligent, and actually comes together as a whole movie as opposed to just Mm. random shit happening. Well... Which is, it's weird that you should say that because the goal of the filmmakers was to make it random shit happening. I think they failed. They, they, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think they failed. They, uh, they, they didn't want that through line. And in fact, they deliberately interrupted it. <laughs> okay. When, I'm not talking about a narrative through line. Right. I'm talking about a thematic through line. Mm. There's a reason for all of these jokes to be together. Mm. They all fit into a mold and they all have a general attitude about history, which I think is kind of neat. Mm. Uh, the movie is Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Monty Python and the Holy Grail is one of the most quoted comedies mm. ever, and with good cause, because a lot of the quotes mm. are really funny. Uh, Whitney, are we the knights who say knee? Uh, I'm sorry, what, is that from this movie, or that's that's Life of Brian, right? 
No. Which one was that from? Okay, you're no, Mon- you're no Monty Python, Whitney. I- <laughs> you're no Monty Python. I am a Monty Python. I discovered Monty Python when I was 12. I voraciously consumed Monty Python. I own mm-hmm. the entire series. I've seen all the movies. My dad was a big Probably Monty Python Probably dozens fan. of times each I can recite Holy Grail to my you. Dad I'm was that a big, guy. My dad was a big Monty Python fan. We watched the show over and over and over mm. again. Um, the favorite Monty Python movie in our household was actually Life of Brian mm. because my dad was a huge Roman history buff. Okay. But what I like about The Life of Brian and uh, Holy Grail is they're not just random gags in a historical setting. They actually, like, when they came time, when they came time to make a movie, and they'd already made a movie called And Now for Something Completely Different, which was pretty much comprised entirely of sketches they had already done on their show, but refilmed with eh, better locations, mm. better budget. Just bit more, on, on film with film cameras. A bit yeah. more of a transition between some of them, but yeah, it was basically just the show writ large. Monty Python and the Holy Grail was their first real movie, and I use that in air quotes. <laughs> and it was it was constructed entirely for the for, to be a feature film, and they decided rather than do just another random cavalcade of sketches, we're going to set it around a basic plot, which is King Arthur assembles the Knights of the Round Table and they search for the Holy Grail. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's the whole thing. But within that, they decided to build a whole bunch of sketches that all take place in the same time period that lampoon the same attitudes, well, the ki- same kind of the same time period. Well, yes, but <laughs> they, they play with that. They play with that. But the idea is this sort of Arthurian tradition, this look back at this heroic, beautiful, legendary time in British history. And they were mostly a British comedy mm. troupe. Uh, we're going to roll that in the mud. Yeah. Everything's going to be mucky and well, gross and kind of pathetic. And we're just going to take the piss out of, legend and we're going to take the piss out of history and as a result even though the plot yeah the plot collapses like a flan in a cupboard but it all is it, tied it, together by a general attitude it, and a general yeah. reason to exist the, the plot doesn't collapse they they just step on it and push it away <laughs> <laughs> They, they don't put a flan in a cupboard. It's like, okay, we've made a flan. What do we do with it? We put it in the ceiling fan. <laughs> um more than sort of spoofing Arthurian legend, I think what they're really getting at uh, is the way British film tended to treat said legends. Yeah. There, and this is what uh, uh, Flying Circus really got a lot of mileage out of. There was a lot of spoofs of BBC television and TV documentaries and a, a kind of s- stern uprightness and class to uh, British media Mm -hmm. at the time that they were clearly sending up. And I think this is an extension of that. There, there was a attitude about the Arthurian legend. It is a British legend. It's, you know, Sir Thomas Mallory wrote Lamort D'Arthur and takes place on the islands. And it's about sort of these British traditions and British media would treat that as something very serious and And, sacred and yeah, and something very sacred. And they would have experts come on and talk about it. And Mm -hmm. Monty Python and the Holy Grail has an expert. It has a documentarian in modern clothes show up and the legend bursts out of his narration and murders him. Yeah. Knight just rolls up (laughs) in the middle of him. Now here's what King Arthur did. He went from Silesia over to stab. (laughs) Hey, slice. (laughs) So it, it's it, this is a film that is deliberately murdering media, and, and that's that's always been Monty Python's uh, strength and their, not, their main reason. But it's not exist. just murdering media, and by and by and by tackling the way that the media has been presenting the legend of King Arthur for so long as this beautiful, fanciful time mm. of lovely people, Light, knights, knights errantry and yeah. chivalry, uh, gallantry yeah. and virginity, yeah. and oh, so shining and gleaming. And then we get to Monty Python of the Holy Grail, and there's a whole scene about filth farmers. They literally farm filth. <laughs> They're not even filming. There's, there's some lovely filth over here. Yeah, there's a scene, one of the best scenes in movie history, the bring out your dead scene, where yeah. it's just this humdrum aspect of life, where things are so bad just for, that- mo- for everyone who isn't the king, that just every day, just throw another corpse on, oh, you got another corpse? Throw it on the pile. Bring, bring out, out your dead. dead. <laughs> bring, I'm not dead yet. And, uh, yeah, and of course the joke is a guy's trying to bring out the dead and the guy's not dead. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> It's like, I well, feel happy. It's, yeah, 
I'll be dead in a moment. Is there anything you can do? I'm, I'm not coming around for next week. I don't want him another week. It's trying to just get rid of this guy. Thunk. Oh, thank you very uh, much. And, and, you know, they make fun of sort of the, the nobility of that era. And really, it was like horrific for the peasants. So mm-hmm. there's a whole speech with the filth farmers about how they live in an, ar- an anarcho syndicalist commune. Well, and they, they, they take that opportunity. There's a whole scene to, to address and, like the, the inequality of the divine right of kings. It is actually a very intelligently mm-hmm. written takedown. Mm-hmm. Of the entire history of, of British of royalty, royalty. Yeah. <laughs> the very concept of royalty, mm. the very concept of the Arthurian idea that there is someone who is destined to and and worthy of being king, mm. is just slapped in the face. <laughs> they take the idea of the uh, the virginal, pure mm. uh, uh, ladies in waiting, and we come up with Castle Anthrax, which is basically a whole bunch of women waiting, and they're just waiting to have sex with anyone who will come along and and they and they come upon the one who has taken a vow of chastity yep that's and it's the, really that's funny the joke, and it's really funny and it's really funny all between 15 and 19 and a half dressing undressing making exciting underwear <laughs> that's all they do <laughs> um and 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 Another cool thing about Monty Python and the Holy Grail is that it's actually a pretty good looking movie. It's murky and gross mm. and they clearly filmed it in various national parks where if you mm. turn the camera slightly to the left you'd have seen a Coke vending machine. Yeah, or some of those castles are really only like four feet tall. But what's great about it is that when they didn't have the money they use that as a joke. When it, mm. something is clearly a model they say it's clearly a model. And when they can't afford horses they just take two coconuts which mm. you would have used to foley the sound of horse hooves. Foley is the act of adding sound mm. effects after you're done filming it because they don't all get picked up on a, on a I microphone. Think, I think people know what Foley is now. Just in case. Oh, I, know, so I know we have some younger listeners. Foley is the is, oh. a great, is a great job if you can get it. And it's just basically you add footsteps and How'd... fist punches and clickety clacks. Anything that doesn't get picked up on, a, on the mic. And when you have horse hooves, you frequently use coconuts. You saw a coconut in half and you just click yeah, them together. Yeah, hollow out the fruit. And yeah, you click out the, the shells. Yeah. And it makes a hollow horse clack noise. So in Monty Python on the Holy Grail, mm. uh, Arthur is miming being on a horse while his manservant, Patsy, mm. clicks on the coconuts. And it, that's it, the whole gag. It's an, abs- but, an absurdist way to get around the fact that they had a low budget. And, and, it's, then, and it's a great absurdist joke. And right? then in the opening scene, someone just flat out asks, where did you get coconuts? It's they, medieval England. <laughs> no, notice they don't ask why he's not on a horse. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you're riding on a horse, you're using coat. Where did you get the coconuts? <laughs> we found them. Found them in Mercia. This is a temperate zone. Notice we can quote this whole damn movie. Um, but yeah, I, 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 and I, I love the way that Monty Python have tried really, really hard to completely jettison any sense of rising tension or narrative purpose. Mm-hmm. And just when you think the story is coming to a head, there's a big climactic moment. Uh, at one point, there's a huge climactic moment. There's a big uh, musical swell, and then it'll cut to intermission. Yeah, just abruptly, and it'll be and the intermission. The movie's almost over. The movie's by the almost way. over. Not and even yeah, the middle of the film. We'll, we'll have an intermission, and it'll cut back, and the dramatic music will comp- you know immediately start up again, and they get to this big climactic moment, and then it's just a callback at some point. Like the music stops, it's a callback. And they they try to rally and have this big climactic battle, and then the film stops dead. Yeah, the cops show up and shut down the production shut down the and production, arrest everybody because they killed the documentarian. And that's the end of the movie. Yeah. And um, I saw an interview. I was uh, one of the anniversaries of Monty Python, and they got them all out on stage, and they... They said that their whole point was try to not have punchlines. They were tired of the way c- conventional jokes were constructed. So you'll watch Monty Python, uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus, mm-hmm. and occasionally they'll say things like, "This is a silly sketch. Do you want to stop it?" And they say, "Yeah." And they, the sketch just ends. They yeah. don't have a punchline. Occasionally they did. Usually they did. And and in once they in one they did have a punchline, but they had to call attention to it. And it, now the punchline. I'm glad I didn't say anything about the dirty knife. And then everybody <laughs> boos. It's like that's a terrible punchline. Uh, so. They, they were really trying to very actively eschew all of the, the narrative conventions. And uh, Terry Jones pointed out that the word Python-esque appears in the Oxford Eng- English Dictionary is a testament to how badly they failed <laughs> to, to be undefinable. <laughs> well, you they because that's yeah. the thing. They were trying to jettison and, and rebe- rebel against all conventional attitudes about comedy and media. Mm. And... 
but they did so with their own personality and that couldn't help but come through. And so everything that they do feels like these guys did it. <laughs> so it has almost an ineffable quality of yeah, it. And like yeah. a, a Python has been Python-esque has been used to describe a, a Dada-ish sense of humor and Whitney mm-hmm. you're a genius describe Dada as a, <laughs> to our uh, listeners because this, this is one not everyone knows Dada is sort of the uh, early uh, artistic movement connected with surrealism that has to do with uh, a deliberate jettison of meaning uh, yeah it's that you cannot it's not symbolic art it is uh, art straight from the subconscious uh, frequently mm-hmm. in media and moving media and movies and television this tends to involve non sequitur images yeah. that do not belong together scenes that don't connect and yeah. um, and Monty Python really worked really hard to do that as much as they possibly could. There was a lot of seeming randomness. Mm-hmm. But within that randomness, you can find a consistent tone or a consistent sort of attitude about British culture, mm-hmm. about the way comedy itself is constructed. And they really do fall into a rhythm. And one of the reasons why I like their movies, particularly uh, Holy Grail, Right. Life of Brian, and even to an extent, the meaning of life is that which is a flat lesser. It's film, a lesser right? film, but there's so many great bits in it. There's so many great that scenes look, in it. Some of the best Monty I, Python scenes ever in that movie. Every sperm is sacred is them and their A game, but it's a bit in a shoddy film. My, mm. I, I like it more than you. Fine, but my point is, is that they all sort of they're trying to capture every aspect of something, which mm. is basically, hey, we've got King Arthur. What's every sketch we could do with that as a basic idea? Mm. And they managed to come up with a series of sketches which mostly fall into a loose narrative order. (laughs) Uh, And they managed to come up with things that are just blindly silly, like Mm. a killer rabbit. Well, we can't afford an actual monster. We'll just get a rabbit hand puppet and throw it at people. It'll be the deadliest (laughs) thing ever. Funny! But we also have, like, real pointed political and human satire Mm. and historical satire and artistic satire. And we'll end up coming together with, uh, if you look at, like, adaptations of Arthurian lore, kind of a perfect amalgamation of everything that exists, but from a critical perspective. Mm. You know, you look at something that's really celebratory about King Arthur, like John Borman's Excalibur, a movie which I also think is great. Yeah. But that's a very earnest version of it. Mm. This is basically just people just taking it apart with a scalpel, seeing what works, yeah. seeing, you know, the, the actual ugly truth underneath all the fantasy, and just saying, well, how can we f- s- introduce this in the funniest way possible? And they do. Yeah. And they do that with uh, the, the life of... Uh, the, the time period of Jesus Christ and the mm. idea of religious fervor and they do it in a much looser way in Meaning of Life which is basically just how do we get the whole of human experience into yeah. one movie yeah. everything from birth to after we die mm. every day is Christmas in heaven that's right uh, <laughs> and when they do that when they get that ambition it really brings out the well, best in what, them I think what, what they are is critics and even when which is might sound sort of highfalutin about these uh, you know twenty something British dudes who were just running around the streets of London filming whenever they could and making stupid jokes and even some dirty jokes. Uh, they they were really kind of trying to uh, undo ordinary convention, and I think that's what a lot of the greatest comedians do is they're they're trying to criticize and call attention to a lot of hypocrisy and a lot of strangeness and the inherent absurdity of life. Mm-hmm. There's going to be something strange about your everyday transactions. Uh, Monty Python was brilliant about bringing out that silliness and amplifying that silliness, uh, not just in society but in the way the media was treating society. And uh, yeah, it, they remain to this day one of the greatest bits of absurdist and satirical humor uh, that has been produced, uh, which kind of culminated in many ways with Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yeah. Uh, So we've said it before, Hmm. and we'll say it again and again and again until people figure it out and we don't have to say it anymore. Hmm. Uh, It takes a lot of intelligence to make a good dumb comedy. Yeah. Monty Python and the Holy Grail feels like a dumb comedy. Because there's a lot of silliness in it. Mm. There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, what do you call it? There's a Trojan rabbit that gets yeah. <laughs> flung everywhere and, and people throw cows mm. and, and get devoured by beasts and, say, and holy say, hand grenades. And, say strange things like your mother was a, ha- your father, yeah. your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries. elderberries. All of these mm. things are very, 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 very silly. But what separates Holy Grail from a lot of the other stupid comedies, even of the era, 
Mm-hmm. When was the last time you heard someone talk about the Carry On films? It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> There's this root I, intelligence. I saw my first Carry On film just sort of, sort of recently for the first time. Tell people about Carry On. Uh, it, it was a series of deliberately crass slapstick comedies uh, that came out of England at the time. And, and they were there were a ton of them. There were, there were t- like dozens there, or something? There were a couple dozen of them. I saw Carry On Cleo, which was the spoof of Cleopatra. Yeah. And yeah, it, it was just you know, broad television level humor. It's a lot of silly Mostly sex jokes. Yeah. So like something like mm. that, something that doesn't, you don't put a lot of thought into it. You're just kind of throwing something out to be just mm. sort of blandly entertaining, like a lot of the, the date movies, the mm. epic movies. Oh, the carry on films aren't bad like that. Fair but, enough. Uh, but my point is, is that they're, they're, they're not aiming very high and they're not putting a lot of thought and effort into them. Mm. And they might be mildly amusing for an evening, but in 20 years, they're dead. <laughs> the, the art, the, the thing is forgotten. It might mm. still be available. It might someday be rediscovered for one I reason think... or another, but it's mostly gone. Mm. And something where you put a lot of effort into it from the beginning to make sure that it actually has a cohesive tone, a cohesive idea. Everything sort of exists, not just to just, not just to shock you, but to actually like explore a basic premise, just even that much. You actually end up with something that people can talk about and rally behind and will think is funny continually, Mm -hmm. even after the shock of the joke Mm -hmm. is worn off. Here's a question I I have. Um, Monty Python seems to have fallen out of favor in recent years. Hmm. Uh, you and I watched Holy Grail incessantly, sure. and I think a lot of people our age did, but I don't know how familiar a lot of uh, younger people might be with uh, Monty Python. I don't know if it's quoted as incessantly or as watched as incessantly as it once was. It might be seen as too old. That happens. And That's a natural I, thing. And more and more often, I hear a lot of criticisms of Monty Python. It wasn't as witty as people thought it was. Uh, a, a lot of the episodes drag. Most of the sketches aren't funny. I'm hearing a lot of backlash Well, here's what I'll over, say about- over the impact of Monty Python. Here's what I'll say about Monty Python uh, and that backlash. Mm. Um, the show was hit or miss. When it hit, mm. it hit great. <laughs> but there were there are indeed sketches and indeed whole episodes which they were experimenting and the experiment didn't quite work. Mm. And maybe the nobility of the experiment isn't as novel now as it was. I, I'll I'm, grant you that. You can. I'm still pick, a huge fan of the show. Though. Can, I, I like every episode of the my show. My point is this: if you've never seen Monty Python and you pick an episode of the show at random, you might not get it. You might not see <laughs> why they're a big deal. Mm. I think if you watch Holy Grail or Life of Brian, those two, mm. I think you will pick up on just how controversial and subversive and intelligent and witty and silly they could be all at the same time. Mm. And I think Holy Grail is still held in pretty high regard. I know Life of Brian is held in pretty high regard in in England. Mm -hmm. Uh, Generally, like when they do like lists of the best comedies ever, uh, Holy Grail is the highest ranking Monty Python movie in most American lists, but in most British lists I've seen, it's it seems to be Life of Life Brian. Brian. I think it, I think it's a little bit more popular, but like the Italian mm. job. The original Italian job is well regarded in America, but it's like a national institution mm. in England. So that there's some cultural variance there. I think Holy Grail is doing okay, but I'm curious, and I want to hear from you, actually, if you're listening. I know we have some younger listeners. If you're in your 20s or even younger, um... First of all, good for you for finding us. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but like, let us know, what is the general attitude towards Monty Python? Are they regarded as an older, funny, but dated comedy troupe, much in the same vein as the Marx Brothers or Abbott and Costello or the Three Stooges? Are they still sort of alive and vibrant in the conversation of people who at least care about film? Hmm. Um, do you feel like most of the people you know are at least passingly familiar with Holy Grail? I'm curious. Yeah. Because I think Holy Grail and Life of Brian, again, in particular, they deserve to last. Because not only are they really funny, they're really thoughtful, they're really insightful, they have a lot to say about history, and they're good movies. They're silly mm. movies, they're meandering movies yeah. sometimes, but they're good movies. And Terry, Terry Jones directed both of them. Uh, uh, Terry, Gilliam Terry directed Gilliam, half of... Uh, Terry Gilliam is credited as a co-director on Holy Grail when, when he really, he just did the production design. Yeah. Uh, like, they said, why don't you both direct it? And Terry Gilliam went mad with the production design. He's like, yeah, this is, this is great. When are you going to start directing? As soon as I'm done with the project, production design. Yeah, like in six years, J- Jones. <laughs> <laughs> And Terry Jones is, is, is uh, uh, quite a fine director. So, I actually yeah, I mean, like Eric the Viking. No, not everyone does. <laughs> not everyone is willing to admit that. I enjoy Eric the Viking. I'm not ever going to call it a good film. <laughs> okay, that's, that's fair. That's very fair. Um, 
So, yeah, uh, listen, let us know what you think from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. If you've never seen it, mm. oh my God, see it. What do you think? <laughs> it's going to be, it's gonna be well, great. And, and, I really, I would and, love to have that experience. And I'm curious. I'm wondering if, like, if where comedy is and where uh, modern tastes have fallen with a younger generation. So if, if you are in high school right now and you've never seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail and you watch it and you hate it, I would love That's to. Fine, I would love to hear it. I'd love to hear why. And, what, what, uh, I, what I, I want to connect? know. Yeah, I want to know what kind of comedies you do like, and what is considered sort of the the high point of cult comedy. Because you know we're old men. We're out of loop. We're reaching this point. But, like we're both in our we're both in our late thirties. You're still in your late thirties, right? For, uh, for, a couple, more for weeks. a couple more days. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we're, we're both in our late 30s, and we're at this point now where we're sort of more intimately familiar with a lot of media that people who are now adults mm-hmm. in their early 20s was a little behind their time. You know, like, mm-hmm. we, the people weren't alive in the 80s, but now, they, <laughs> but now they're graduating mm-hmm. from college, you know? Yeah. like So these things that were very much just a part of our childhood, and this is one of the reasons why I think some, like, Stranger Things was super popular with younger people, is because it tapped into this thing that they didn't really live through. I yeah. watch a show like Stranger Things, which is all this big homage to everything in the 80s, and I I'm saw, just like... I saw that stuff already. I was yeah. in the 80s! This is just, this just feels like they're doing it all over again. It's not bad, it's, but well, it's not blowing my mind. And that's why people of uh, our age tapped into that whole retro 70s thing that yeah. came along in the 90s. <laughs> Nights came yeah. along and it felt so fresh and yeah, cool. Or, and I want that soundtrack. Or, or everything Tarantino does. Like, oh, this is all Grindhouse from the 70s. Well, if you were into Grindhouse stuff in the 70s, are you going to get high on Tarantino stuff? You saw that stuff already. I was, I was born in 1982. Mm. And when I was in like a teenager, something like The Godfather, which had only come out like 10 years before I was born, mm. you know, before I was born, but not that long ago, was considered a classic. Yeah. I'm curious now for people who are like, you know, in their, in their teens now, is something like Saving Private Ryan considered old movie and like an yeah. old classic? Like, I'm just curious, like, how, where that attitude is. I mean, you think about <laughs> actors who've been around for forever and you see them in a movie, like, when you see someone like, um, I'm trying to think of someone who's been around for, for a Peter long time. Peter O'Toole. Peter O'Toole is, I'm talking about someone who's still working. Oh, still working. Still working. Like, um, oh, uh, who starred in Body Heat? Who was the guy? William Hurt. William Hurt. William Hurt still pops up in like Avengers: Age of Ultron. Okay. Is that like when like Robert Mitchum popped up in Scrooge, <laughs> where it's just like I know he's a big star, but I wasn't there for his big start. Mm. I only know him now that he's older and doing kind of smaller things in other people's movies. Well, I, don't, I, I think Mitchum had sort of stepped away for a while. William Hurt has worked constantly. Well, it's not, not a good one to one. It's not yeah. a good analog, but you know what I mean. Like these mm. are people who were like big big stars in the eighties, and now. What's the attitude towards them? Mm-hmm. Are they like you know? Oh, it's kind of cool to see Fred Astaire working still, or what's going on? Like, what's the mm-hmm. what's the vibe? Wouldn't it be great if Steve Gutenberg came back as like a Marvel villain? <laughs> no. That'd be great. No, it really wouldn't. Yeah, I'm fine. Just fold fold him into that dough. No, thank you. Nah. We're good. Wouldn't it be great if the Avengers series just came to a dead halt right here? Yeah, just stop now. Like they didn't they didn't really make like, we'll, Captain we'll, Marvel. It was no, all just no, a big Captain, fake we, out. I, we waited long enough for Captain Marvel. We'll let him have Captain Marvel, but all then right. we're done. Then we're done. Just everyone died. Then yeah, that was it. Yeah, we had we had superheroes. It ended in a cavalcade of death. That's it. Problem. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't that be awesome? That would be. Uh, that, that would be, be bold. S- it'd be bold. I think. I think it'd be kind of awesome. All right. We're gonna do a fourth Avengers. Psych. <laughs> Everybody, thank you very much for listening to Critically Acclaimed. <laughs> uh, we will be back next week with. Uh, at the end of every month, we usually do. A whole movie franchise. This week, this month, we decided to mix it up. We had a lot of requests for us to do like a whole director's filmography. Yeah. So we put it to a vote, and majority of people voted for Tim Burton. So we're going to be doing the filmography of Tim Burton. All of it. Yep. And we've seen all of it, so it should be an interesting conversation. Yeah. L- luckily, Tim Burton is a filmmaker we're already kind of familiar with and have things to say about. So yeah, we didn't have to start from scratch with Tim Burton. Mm. So, uh, but uh, it should be an interesting conversation to have, and I'm looking forward to delving into his whole filmography with you. But uh, it does mean that for next month, uh, we're going to go back to franchises, uh, and we want you to vote in our latest critically acclaimed poll on the Schmoville exclamation point Facebook page. We want you to vote for which franchise we'll review at the end of next month. And we decided this time mm. we want to do older franchises. Skew them a little more classical. Yeah, like just ones that are gone, that are, that are done, um, and were once really huge and are well regarded two or, two or three of them. Two out of mm. three of these are very well regarded still. One of which was a huge blockbuster franchise in the 50s that is now mostly forgotten. <laughs> Seriously, it was huge. And um, just think it might help put us in a little bit of context. Because I think some people think like, oh yeah, 
you know, the DC Extended Universe or the Marvel Cinematic Universe or the Fast and Furious movies, they'll never end. They might. And, and you Sometimes know what? they do. They might even be forgotten. They can happen. <laughs> it like, can happen. Like, it's not Something. too late for Star Wars to be a fad. <laughs> it's actually not like when you look at like when you look Get back it. at like art history, it's like oh yeah yeah cubism lasted a few decades. So did Star Wars mm. <laughs> for only forty years. Yeah, not in the grand scheme of things, not that long. In any case, your options for the poll mm. on the Facebook page are Francis the Talking Mule. Yeah, Francis the Talking Mule. This was a huge blockbuster comedy franchise in the 1950s. It was basically Mr. Ed before Mr. Ed. Mm. If you remember what Mr. Ed is, and I realize <laughs> we just talked about how young our demographic is. Mr. Ed was they a sitcom in the 1950s about a guy who had a talking horse. They haven't done the high-octane reboot of Mr. Ed yet. It's only a matter of time. It'd be like War Horse. Yeah. These were the, these were the broad, silly, slapsticky comedies mm. that people flocked to throughout the 1950s, and it'd be interesting to uh, discover them. I've never seen them. I've only heard the legends. And so this would be interesting. Five, six. Uh, five. I think there's seven. Oh, geez. There's like six or seven. There's quite a few. Mm. Uh, next up, your next option is The Thin Man. Mm-hmm. The Thin Man is a series of mystery comedies. Uh, they were immensely popular. I think the first one was nominated for Best Picture. I think it was. Uh, yeah. They're based on the works of Dashiell Hammett. Uh, they are about a drunk, but mostly in love couple of crime-solving slews and their adorable Mar- dog. Married, yeah, married couple. Uh, and uh, they are witty, and they are funny, and they solve murders. And I've seen a lot of them already. It's been a long time. Mm. There's they're six, so good. There's, there's six of those. There's, yeah. They're really clever and witty and fun. And if you've never heard of them, if you've never watched them, mm. it would be really fun to explore them with you and maybe hopefully get you interested in them because they're great. And I'm also waiting. There's only a matter of time before they reboot this someday because they're they've so been, good. And they've been talking about it for, for a while. Forever. Yeah, to, 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 God, like twenty years ago, I remember there was going to be one with like Johnny Depp, and they couldn't yep. find and they couldn't find a, a Myrna Loy. Standard, yeah, I think they couldn't. Yeah. It's all about chemistry, and they couldn't mm-hmm. put it together. And then the last option, I think this is an option we had for our, uh, April uh, mm-hmm. month when we tried to do nothing but really classy ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, your last option are the Yojimbo films. Uh, Akira Kurosawa, one of mm-hmm. the greatest filmmakers who ever lived, uh, did not one but two motion pictures starring Toshiro Mifune as a wandering samurai. They're both classics. However, he also did a third film in which he encountered, this is separate from Akira Kurosawa, in which Yojimbo met the wandering blind samurai Zatoichi. Mm. There was also a fourth unofficial Yojimbo movie. <laughs> which would get to, but just to, to fill we, out the, the filmography. Also yeah. because I think it's f- a fan- a phenomenal motion picture. All right. Uh, Incident at Blood Pass. I haven't I, I haven't seen those last two. I have. I've, I've seen, seen them all. Jimbo all and I've, I've seen, seen them all. I'm a big but fan. Yeah. You know, I've seen none of the Francis mm. movies. I've seen about half of the Thin Man movies, and I've seen all of the Ojimbo movies. Mm. The Ojimbo movies are the, kind of the basis on which a lot of modern action movies are are mm. are built. Yeah. We already talked about Seven Samurai back in April. Mm. This would be an opportunity to talk about even more. Yeah. Of that, and we can talk about all of the many American movies which only exist because they ripped off Yojin. <laughs> uh, so those are your options. We'll mm. review one of those franchises in their entirety at the end of August and next week. We'll review all the Tim Burton movies. We'll also be reviewing Mission Impossible Fallout and a new independent movie called Puzzle, mm. which is and, about a puzzle. And, and maybe some others, whatever Perhaps. we can get to. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> Whitney, I know you're a busy man. Do we have time no. for a couple letters? Sadly, we do not. I Damn have it. to hit the road. Okay, yeah. here's what's going to happen. Next week, we will either, depending on how long the Tim Burton thing goes, because there's a lot of Tim Burton movies, mm. we will either do a lot of letters or we will do a bonus episode I, in which we catch up on some letters. Which we've done before. So, yeah. yeah we, I, a lot of you have been writing in, and I'm sorry that uh, my schedule has been preventing me Two weeks, me from, no uh, letters in a row, I feel bad about. Okay. And if we can't get to a lot of them next week, we will do a bonus episode mm. in the very near future just to catch up a bit and give everybody their time. Yeah. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening to Critically Acclaimed. You're really great. You um, are really great. It's, good, good looking too. Yeah, Look at you. It's 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 a big, busy, and in some cases, really terrible week. Um, mm. uh, a lot of people are uh, really reeling from the passing of John Schnepp over yeah, at Collider. Yeah. Um, we've tried to keep it kind of light here. Um, I, I didn't know him terribly well, but he was mm. always really nice and kind and very intelligent kind every time we talked. He was and, very enthusiastic. He was very talented. I did get, did get to compete against him in the Schmodown once. That's right. In the Ash vs. Evil Dead celebrity Schmodown. So I did get to interact with him at least that day. Yeah. We, we had some, uh, some, some 
some conversations and he was nothing but a kind man. And I have uh, just nothing but kind words and, and sympathy for his passing. It's, it's been nothing short of inspirational to see people rally behind him, mm. you know, in the days leading up to his passing uh, mm. when we weren't sure. And, and now it, at, in the end, and um, I think we should all be so lucky as to have left that kind of an impact mm. on people. But so when re- all is said and done. So, so re- rest in peace, Mr. Schnapp. You, you were a great man. And, it, and you're so. definitely, uh, judging by the reaction, you're very deeply missed. Yes. Uh, lovely human being. Mm. And um, yeah, it's, it's a sober note on which to end. Mm. But um, thank you, everybody, again, for listening. Um, we're, we're around on the internet. You can, you can read our work us. at criticallyacclaimed.net. Uh, yeah. You can uh, join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash cancel too soon, cancel with one L. Mm-hmm. You can listen to our other podcast, Cancel Too Soon. We review TV shows last lasted one season or less. I'm um, on Twitter at William Bibiani. I'm uh, at Whitney Seibold. And um, hey, um, we can, and, uh, collectively, we're critic acclaim on Twitter. That's right. And um, <laughs> uh, listen, before we, we sign off mm-hmm. and say our usual stake, just um, take a moment today and remember that uh, life is fleeting and we all just have responsibility to be kind and tell someone you care about that you love them today. I think that would Mm. do everyone a world of good. So thank you everybody and never forget, everyone's a critic.